Okay, well, it is five o'clock, and I'd like to call the Dublin City Council um, Monday, August 30th meeting. Um, Jenny, would you please call the roll? Mayor Ambrose Grooms. Here. Vice Mayor DeRosa. Here. Ms. Saludo. Here. Mr. Keeler. Here. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Reiner. And the order of tonight's uh, meeting will be a little bit different than what we typically would do. We will have, we will finish up our CIP discussion that we did not finish uh, in our work session this week. Uh, and then we will adjourn uh, to executive session. Uh, and then we will come back and have our formal city council meeting, the balance of it at 7 p.m. So I wanna make sure if anybody was tuning in that they understood the order of events for this evening. So without further ado, welcome Matt, thank you. Thank you. So today uh, we're gonna continue and complete the project overview, have a parkland acquisition discussion, the debt profile, a sewer and water fund discussion, and then address some questions that were raised uh, today. So proceeding through with the water projects, once again, we're going to discuss the water project funding in a little bit more detail later in this presentation, but in general, the uh, Water Fund is funding the tank repainting and the booster station upgrades, as well as the water line replacement. Water line extensions are being funded through a transfer from the Capital Improvements Fund to the Water Fund. And we have some details on uh, some projects. Thank you, Matt. Good evening, members of council. Uh, two projects that we wanted to feature in the CIP as it pertains to water. Um, so the Tartan West water tank repainting, uh, this project um, is for the exterior painting, dry interior. It's actually not for the wet interior, it's just for the exterior painting and dry interior of the Tartan West uh, water tank. The adhesion test was completed by uh, Dixon Engineering and calls for an overcoating. So it'll look the same as, as you see on your screen, only it'll be an overcoating, a new coat of paint. Are there any questions on this project? And the other project that we wanted to call to your attention is the Tartan West and Post Road uh, booster station upgrade. Um, so this upgrades the existing booster station with the addition of a water quality monitoring unit. Um, the increase, uh, this or the, I should say, this will increase efficiency as well as uh, water pressure. There will also be some exterior improvements uh, featuring repainting fascia board and we're also looking at um, roof replacements as well. So this, the construction for this program is programmed for 2022. Are there any questions on this or, or any other projects that are listed in the CIP? Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. The first topic of uh, conversation with regard to the, some of the policy changes that are being proposed in the CIP regards uh, Fund 402, the Parkland Acquisition Fund. On this slide, there's a lot going on, but the orange bars represent the actual fund balance of the Parkland Acquisition Fund. The gray bars represent the estimated or, uh, uh, yeah, the estimated fund balance in 2021 and future years. You can see that the fund balance was historically at its highest level at 2008, uh, was reduced to its lowest level in 2014, and has grown steadily since about 2017. The line on that graph represents the millage, the inside millage that's been allocated to the Parkland Acquisition Fund over the last 20 years. The maximum millage of 1.75 was allocated in the early years from 2001 to 2006. From 2006 to 2011, the, fund, the millage was reduced to its current rate of 0.35 mills, where it has remained steady uh, for the last nine years and is projected um, if, if no policy changes would be projected to remain steady in this CIP uh, with the resulting fund balance. Um, as you can see, as you would expect, when the millage was high early in the funds here, the fund balance did grow quickly. But what you might not expect is that while the millage was low since 2011, the fund balance has continued to grow and is projected to do so in the future. The next slide provides some additional details on why that is the case. So from at least 2016, the fund balance has been shedding debt obligations um, and in the process has been accumulating and allow being allowed to keep more of the revenue that is distributed and deposited into that fund. So you can see annual revenue has been between 763,000 and 854,000 
uh, for the last five years. Those other expenditures represent county auditor deductions, so those are deductions to, in order to collect the property tax. The Metro Parks payment was a $385,000 annual payment for, the, for 15 years from 2002 to 2017, totaling $5.7 million. That was completed in 2017. Kaufman Park debt of $3.1 million will be, was repaid in 2020 with a final payment of $207,000. And there was a general fund transfer for $1.9 million for the purchase of riverfront properties uh, pursuant to the development of Bridge Park. Uh, that was repaid in full in 2019. So you can see that 2021 is the first year that none of these prior obligations exist. It's important to point out that that $415,000 is a one-time expenditure associated with the parkland for the North Riverview property. So that is where that expenditure comes from. In this environment, without making any policy changes, the Parkland Acquisition Fund balance will grow relatively quickly from the current projection of $2.8 million to over $7 million by the end of the CIP. And that's why we're proposing that we kind of examine what that, what that millage should be in this CIP. We also wanna acknowledge that future, fund land for park, uh, future funding for Parkland is necessary. The policy that we're putting forward in the proposed 2022 to 2026 CIP maximizes the flexibility regarding land acquisition by allocating 100% of the inside millage to the capital improvements fund. It then restricts that inside millage inside the capital improvements fund for land acquisition. This would be a council level restriction as opposed to funding in the parkland acquisition fund which can only be used for parkland acquisition. That restriction would be a legal restriction. Um, with that, I'm prepared to answer any questions. Questions from council? Go ahead. You know, um, so it, let, let's just clarify, the funding in the Parkland acquisition will get 0% coming forward, and the balance in that fund now is balance is $2.8 million projected at the end of this year. Okay. And, and my understanding is that that's been significantly reduced over the last five to six years, right? So, um, you know, I, I suppose when we were doing a lot of land acquisition. Um, I would like um, maybe, maybe Greg or, or John to, to just give me a little history on the reasoning for having the Parkland Acquisition mm -hmm. Fund as healthy as it was during a period of years and, and, and why it, you kept it at that level and, and why it was changed so I can understand whether or not a 0% um, um, growth in that fund is, is correct, if you can help me with that. Well, I think, you know, part of this was that we were uh, in the process of acquiring, um, during those periods, we went to acquire land along the river. So we just let it run. And that's, you know, and then eventually it started dropping back down because it just made sense. But there was an aggressive period for uh, land acquisition for riverfront property. So we'd, you know, secretly acquire the uh, riverfront, but on both sides, but then I think as time went on, we realized, hey, you know, this was way too much money, so. You're saying it's, it's well, I, I didn't get that last part, I'm just. Oh, well, I think we, we realized it was just too much money. I mean, we had too much money in the fund. Too much in the Parkland Acquisition yes. Fund is what you're saying. Yeah, that's the way I recall it. Well, that was, about six years before I came back onto council. So I don't know that I can shed a lot of light about what happened in 2008 and why it was so high. I would, and Matt, maybe you could comment on this. We did have an increased, uh, we were more aggressive about acquiring land for economic development purposes. So I think, and I don't, I'm not saying that same money was shifted over, but we did get more aggressive in purchasing land for purposes other than just parkland. And as we started to grow out, I think there was this sense that we were sort of getting built out. There were no, no there were no more, you know, Metro Park parks that were gonna be coming in. And so it was probably more of a correction than an adjustment. Would you agree, Matt, or, or, or not? I mean, I know this is probably, yeah. this was well before you being as involved as you are now, but I think the evolution of that is its function 
um, became less critical, like John said. And we realized we had all this money sort of budgeted or earmarked, and it wasn't really ever going to be spent, and so it needed to be moved into other places. It was more of an evolution, I think, than, than a decision, okay, we're not going after parkland anymore, you know? And, and maybe my other question is to, to Jennifer or to Megan. Is the Parkland Acquisition Fund only for Parkland acquisition? It's not for any maintenance, yeah. any rehab, any redoing. It's simply to buy new parkland. Correct. Is there a policy on what the level of that funding should be within that fund? There is not a fund balance policy on that fund. Okay. All right, so, so I'm curious to hear maybe from Chris. I, I have some concerns about that and a few other things about the parks, but I'll, I'll leave that to further discussion. So Matt, you anticipate the fund balance growing to over $7 million by 2026? If we don't make a policy change, then that would be my... And we don't be purchase any... And, and we don't purchase any, correct. Um, I guess I've never been supportive of defunding our parkland acquisition fund. Um, I, I understand the principle that you can buy, you can still buy parkland with general fund revenues, but it makes it more and more difficult. And as times get um, tight and opportunities arise, then the conversation has to be, are we going to issue debt? How are we going to fund this? Um, and I think, you know, maybe we don't let it grow in perpetuity. Maybe we have a fund balance policy. I think, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of four to five million dollars in parkland acquisition is the right amount to have in that fund. And, um, but to completely defund it is, you know, and, and we're nowhere close to that. that. That's not even a decision that we have to make. It doesn't, if we bought nothing, we wouldn't cross that threshold till 2025. Um, so I don't know that that's a decision of what is the right number that we need to make today. But I just think it's, Dublin is what it is largely due to our green space and our parks. And those decisions to acquire parks get more difficult if you don't have a pot of money in which to buy them from. And I do want to be a good steward of, of the public dollar and all of those things. And I don't want to hoard large sums of money but I do think it's important to keep enough money to do what you want to do. Um, you know, who knows what our, what the bonding capabilities will be and all of, you know, the different hoops you have to jump through or what the market might be. What if we had an unbelievable opportunity come to pass and the bond rate, the bond market was really negative and it was going to cost us significantly more money to do than it would if we just simply had a parkland acquisition fund. So I, I think for all of those reasons, it is wise to continue to contribute to the Parkland Acquisition Fund. Now, what that contribution is and what the ceiling is, I think that is an appropriate discussion to have, but I think it, it would be really short-sighted. You, you know, you look and you look at the things that Bridge Park was able to come to pass. Imagine if we had to sell another $7 million worth of debt in order to make some of those acquisitions along the river to relocate Riverside Drive and all of those things it would have been even a greater hurdle to have to cross. Um, and then secondly, I would only say that parkland that is attractive to us is getting more and more expensive. So I agree that we are largely built out and there isn't that much out there left to buy, but what is left out there to buy is certainly more expensive than some of, you know, than when we bought Avery Park, I don't know what we paid for an acre out there, but it wouldn't hold a candle. It's probably, I don't know, ten, twelve, twelve thousand dollars an acre, something like that, maybe back in the day. So we're not going to get those kind of deals anymore. Um, so I'll get off my soapbox, but that's why I, it's not worth throwing the baby out with the bathwater on the whole CIP budget to me. But I, I do not agree with this. Thanks, um, if I may. Uh, I, I, I tend to agree um, to a, a, a point. I, I would prefer to do a parkland fund policy so that we keep some of this money earmarked specifically for purchasing that land. Um, I think seven million is probably too much. I don't know what that right number is, um, but I think that's the discussion that needs to happen. I think Chris outlined the reasons for that and I'm pretty well aligned with what she said. Um, you know, I don't know if that's a conversation that, um, you know, maybe we need some feedback from, from 
the balance of council to see what their appetite is for having a fund policy. So I, there's no reason to just let it keep growing and growing and growing. I, there, we're not going to use it all if we keep doing that. But uh, I do see value in earmarking, um, you know, and, and having those funds specifically for parkland acquisition. Um, because part of what I've found over time and just in my experience in business is, you know, you can have an intent where you say this, you know, we don't need to use this for this, right? But over time, as people change and as um, new people step in and new council members step in, the original meaning of what, what you did or why you did something gets lost over time. Um, whereas if you have a, a fund that's specifically for this, whatever the policy ends up being that we come up with, um, the meaning is still there. You can't lose that meaning because you're required to stay true to that meaning as you use these funds. So I would love to hear the balance of council's reaction and then how you want to go about, if everyone's in agreement, um, coming up with that plan. I, I, there, is there a way to realistically tie what's in there to what potential? I know we can't say what opportunities are going to come down the road. There has to be an equation here where we can logically rely upon it because it's it's kind of like putting money in your four hundred one k, right? You put it in, you put in too much, and you can't take it out. And you're like, well, geez, I wish I wouldn't have done that. So you have to find the right mix. And I don't know that the seven of us can sit here. I don't want it to be driven by an emotional reaction that we all love Parkland. So let's show our um, uh, our support of parkland and put a lot of money in there when it isn't necessarily rationally based on some realistic prediction of what is out there. There's my piece. Um, Matt, could you go back to the previous slide where they had the one more, maybe the one where you had the, oh, yeah, that one. Um, it, you know, it seems to me if we just make a, a single $1 million acquisition of anything over the next couple of years, we're right back down to where we started. So to me, we do have a policy. You outlaid the policy. This chart shows the policy. I wonder if it wouldn't be prudent to wait until we get through our Dublin 35 planning, because I know through a lot of that discussion, there was a lot of greenway discussion in that, a lot of major greenways and parkways. And um, since, as I look at this, there doesn't appear to be urgency for this next year to do it. Um, from my perspective, I wonder if that doesn't make some sense because I think in that plan, we will see we will see significant appetite for acquisition of greenways and parkways. Um, so we do have a policy. I I don't think we're going to get to some level of of very high. And what is it until 2026 if we buy nothing and we will buy something. So. I kind of like the policy the way it is until we get the larger framework. That would be my um, my view on it. Kathy, I agree. I think we have time. I don't think we need to do something tomorrow. Um, but I, I also know how things go. And if we don't sort of get it on a docket of some sort in the next year or so, we'll lose it. Um, it can you use this money for greenways or just parkland? Like it has to be specifically parkland. I don't know if you can use it for greenways. I think so. Okay. I think we can use it for greenways. That's good. That's a good clarification. So, because that's a good point. You know, so I wonder. You know, we're gonna we're gonna get that twenty forty five framework put yeah. together here in in the next year. It, it might behoove us to see that because I think we're gonna spend. I think we're gonna spend that money in that plan. Yeah, I, it, it I, seems to me from what I've seen. Anyway, yeah. like I said, I'm in no hurry to. <laughs> I just don't want to lose sight of it. You know, to cost the land right now when you're looking at two million dollars, three million dollars, it's not a lot of money. No. Not for land in Dublin. When land is a hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars an acre, you're not buying much park land. I would just remind everybody that we have backed down. What what were the percentages? Where were we four years ago, five years ago? We were at one point. This is what point two three five or this is point three five. Point three five. So we were at what 1.75 or, or greater i think in in the recent past so we have it has ratcheted back quite a bit um and i just don't think taking it to zero is i don't have much to add you guys are making great comments uh, um, today's day and age is very different from 2008 2009 cost of real estate is probably double, if not more than. Um, so one acquisition would drop a balance of, say, 
7 million, which we're projecting out to 2026 by 30 percent. So I think it's uh, left well enough alone. So I, so I have a question here, the 7 million, and maybe I'm just missing something. If our balance in 2020 is of two and a half million, and you don't dedicate any of the inside millage to the Parkland Acquisition Fund, none, how does it grow to seven million? Well, that's just it. It, it wouldn't done if we didn't dedicate any. This, this graph displays it going to seven million if we didn't have this policy discussion and we right. didn't make any policy changes. That it, it's in those, it's in that scenario that the fund balance grows. Right, because now the parkland gets 0.35? Yes. So at 0.35, if we made no changes in 2026, we'd be at 7 million. Correct. Correct. Okay, but if we go to zero, it's not growing at all. It would stay at 2.8 million. Okay, I just want to make sure we're all clear on that. I, I did want to just provide some some clarification the and, and some future path forward because it if, if your intention is to modify from the proposed, uh, this fund and the land acquisition allocation are interchangeable. So the 750,000 funded through the inside millage was moved to the capital improvements fund, but then dedicated to land acquisition generally. So essentially reversing this policy does not you know, rip apart the CIP in any fundamental way. It changes the allocation from parkland to 750 and reduces the land allocation by 750 in each year moving forward. So the intention wasn't, again, I guess the intention was to uh, add additional flexibility towards land acquisition. So if in a future year there was a land acquisition, parkland fund could be used, there would also be that land acquisition that would have as much money as would have otherwise been deposited in the parkland fund. Uh, just again to increase flexibility for uh, greenway acquisition or, wh or what might come down the path. Right. So my, my only other comment is, is understandably it does offer us flexibility, but without a policy and without, and I know we're looking at our, our, our uh, master park plan, without a policy on how, how and when we use it, whether or not our assets are full enough when it comes to parks, whether or not we're offering the amenities we should, whether we're following the community plan, the citizens' demands for certain things. Without that, then you say to yourself, you might leave yourself short. So I understand we have the flexibility and I'm also agreeing that we don't have to change anything now, but I think we have to keep this on a high level of, of, of discussion because I know Matt is looking at, you know, the master plan and the parks and whether or not we're following it. We're looking at maintenance. We're looking at all kinds of things. And opportunities are going to come along in the 2035, as Kathy said. So, so I guess what I'm saying, and I'd like that noted in our minutes, that this has to be brought back for conversation about parkland policy, how you use it, how much we want in there, and or, going forward. And also because as I ask Greg and John, people coming afterwards need to understand how we use this fund and, and what's appropriate and what's the levels and that sort of thing. So I'm just asking that we do a little work on, on this you know, policy and also funding and, and how we go about using it. And I, I hope that you know, Matt could shed some light on that too when it comes to what's needed. Uh, I'm not sure what's needed out there in the way of future parkland acquisition. Yeah, it'd be interesting in the future, too, to find out, you know, if we can transfer this fund or if that's our policy to the amenities that make up the park. As we're going down the river road right now, yes, we got a bunch of greenway, um, open greenways in the current park from Bridge Street going down. But, you know, what happens if we come up with some kind of grand idea to make it really exciting and dramatic? Where are we going to get the money? Well, this is a potential source of those fundings. And maybe it's a different fund that we need to come up with. Maybe it's a parkland acquisition amenities fund or, or something. You know, we, we could always go that route. But I tell you, it's just like in your own personal household budget, it's really hard to do something big and creative if you don't have a funding stream to do it. It's hard to get it in if it's not set aside at the beginning. Our financial planner guy would know that better than no one else up here. So I, I don't know what the general, you need, what do you need from us on this piece of it, Matt? I think I just need direction. Obviously, we don't want to proceed with the proposed CIP, which set the level of 
zero mills, and we can set it back at the 35 mills, or we can slowly approach a number somewhere between those two. Let me know how much you'd like to see the fund balance grow. I can adjust the millage to make that happen, so we're talking in numbers that we can all understand. It was 750,000 in the prior CIP. This CIP is proposed to be zero. If there's some number between there that you'd like this fund balance to grow, at least in year one, I, I think what I've heard from council is that we're comfortable with leaving the policy where it is at present and that we would like to get on the schedule the discussion of what this is going to look like moving forward. Yeah. Is that accurate? If it's not, please someone correct me. Yeah, and, and I would say that discussion would follow the update of the master plan and the 2035 plan so we're informed in that discussion as to what the long-term vision is because that'll be easier than setting an I don't want to say arbitrary, but just setting a level. I, th I think those two things will inform it greatly. Good. Do you have what you need on that, then? Thank you. Thank you. There was some discussion on debt at our first CIP workshop, so I wanted to follow up on that. Uh, there was a request for our historical debt profile. The one I showed at the first workshop began in 2021 or 2022 with the CIP. This one dates back to the beginning of Dublin's first debt issuances in 1991. And you can see there the, uh, the, the cycle of debt that the city has seen since its uh, inception, essentially, um, and the types of debt that were issued um, over, those, over those years. Uh, taking some of the detail away, the existing debt is gray. The new debt proposed is orange. And I, and I would just remind you that a majority of that uh, debt is the fiber to the home debt of 23 million and then water and sewer extensions per council's policy on, uh, on making those extensions. So the new issuances that are backed by income tax are 5.3 million in 2025. Um, so the new issuances of debt uh, regarding income tax are a few years out and fairly minimal in this CIP. There was some question about um, affordability and what, what can we do? What does this mean? And this, just this graph does a great job of demonstrating how much debt you have. But when you say what can we do, the real question is how much debt can we afford? And this next graph kind of gets to that affordability question. And it's a little bit complicated, but it, it displays kind of a, a complicated issue pretty well, I think, when you, when you get down to it. The green line represents our debt service payments annually. So that is principal and interest. It's related, obviously, to the prior graph, but the prior graph doesn't show interest, so it leaves out part of the story. The orange graphs represent other funding besides income tax that we utilize to pay debt service. So this is water, this is sewer, and this is more and more, as you can see, tax increment financing districts. So that is debt that is paid for by one of those revenue sources. It is also uh, the source of payment for the 23 million in fiber to the home. And this graph is listed as other debt until we establish a funding source, I'm um, sorry, other funds and transfers. So that orange bar represents uh, TIF financing, a uh, majority of it. It also represents a fairly conservative amount of TIF financing as it represents every dollar up to the 90% maximum per any one TIF that can fund debt service. So that orange bar could actually be about 10% higher in some cases. So what I kind of just want to make sure to point out is there's a lot of levels of conservatism and, and kind of pulling back from maybe uh, a full throttle approach on a lot of these numbers. The blue and yellow bar, those represent the 60% of income tax uh, of the 25% that's dedicated to debt service. So that is how much debt we would allow ourselves to undertake under our debt policy. The blue bar represents the amount of that amount that we actually do pay in debt service. The yellow amount represents our excess capacity. So how much more debt could we pay under our debt policy if we were to uh, um, use additional debt. And the important thing there is in 2022, under our debt policy, we could finance an additional $75.8 million in debt. In 2027, which is the most restrictive year remaining, we could finance an additional $72.1 million in debt. And I would also point out 
that, the, that those income tax bars are fairly conservatively estimated too, because I estimated income tax at a 1% growth. Through, through August, we're up 12% this year, which is fantastic, and none of those numbers are reflected in this graph. So it's a fairly conservative approach to our income tax. So what this shows is basically there's approximately $70 million of capacity under our debt policy left, even if we don't establish any more new TIFs, which is not likely because we're establishing TIFs every year in Bridge Park as it continues to develop, which raises that orange bar, which pushes the yellow bar even higher and creates additional capacity. So even if no more TIFs are established between now and roughly 2035, we'd have $75 million in capacity. After that, it begins to open up substantially in terms of debt availability under our debt policy. So that kind of answers the question, what else could we do? And I'm available for any questions. Questions from council? I had a question just for my own clarification. If you could go back to the previous, one more. Um, the blue then again is um, general is unvoted, so that doesn't have TIF, TIF backing. This is the full faith in, of the city, right? That's what the blue bar represents. The blue bar is non-tax revenue. That's actually the taxable portion of the parking garages for Bridge Park. Okay, so what is the portion that is unvoted general fund funded? The green. That's the green bar. Unvoted general obligation is basically the standard debt that we issue. That's what we're issuing, the 1.5 million that we're issuing this year that's backed by sewer debt. Mm -hmm. We pledge the full faith and credit so that we get the AAA rating on that because our sewer fund isn't rated AAA. The city of Dublin is rated AAA. So it's not voted on by the residents of Dublin and it is general obligation debt. Mm -hmm. And the last box, the, the gray with the red, is what has been voted on? For general obligation, so this was a direct taxpayer vote. That would have been the rec center, things like along that nature, et cetera? Given the time frame, I believe so. I haven't spent a lot yeah. of time. Yeah. So, you know, what is interesting to me is I look at this chart, two sort of things. The, the peak in the valleys and the peak in the valleys, and there's a nice rhythm here that says you invest for the future, you pay it down. You invest and you do some paid back. Um, what is interesting to me when I look at this, this is, you know, it's gone from the voters having a voice in the, the de early ad the debt to, to there, it's unvoted debt. I mean, there's just a change. These are just observations that I, that I see. Um, and on the next chart, um, or the, the second one, yeah, the next chart, um, that we, I'm not sure we've peaked yet, right? So we, we had a peak and a decline and a peak and a decline, and that, that high watermark continues to stay, you know, pretty high. So for me, my takeaways from that is um, I, 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 what I like about this particular plan is that it is not debt. I mean, I recognize that there's the fiber to the home numbered here that's unfunded that would recognize it. But I think it continues, from my perspective, to be important to, to, to give us a path to come down the hill so that we can run back up the hill again later when, when significant things happen. So, you know, my observation is we're doing this. this these, aren't, these are not voter-identified um, funds. These are things we, as a council, certainly are making the decisions of. And I'm, I'm more in favor of coming down that hill a little bit and so we can climb up that hill a little bit. Those are, those are my observations, and I appreciate that in, 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 the, in the plan, and continue to say when we can fund this without debt for the next few years, we'll talk a little bit about the beginning balance of the CIP fund. I, I think that's a prudent thing to do. That's my observation. I, I would agree. Uh, I think it's important to kind of keep limits in check. The analogy that I would use with this debt is basically a, a homeowner, whether it's a single income or a dual income homeowner, they're typically borrowing three to four times their annual income. And we're, we're in debt to just over one times. And in a, in a, in a household, you have one or two sources of income. We've got 
four, five, six sources of income. So I'm not opposed to these levels. These levels don't bother me at all, but I agree with, with Kathy, we have to know our limits. Um, and I believe in using other people's money and using it when it's cheap. So the, the bonds that, that we've issued here in the last couple of years, we've done our, our job on that, in my opinion. I, I just have a question. I, I'm sure, I think I know the answer to this. When it comes to debt service, um, I know that we, we talked about revenue. Um, any other any assessments, any grants, any intergovernmental funding that cannot be used to pay for debt service? Generally not, but that would displace other funds that could potentially be used for debt service. But the, generally, I don't think I've ever seen a grant that would that would make a right. debt payment. Right, right. We we'll usually use it for cash funding and that sort of thing. And I'm and I'm and I know we're talking about debt service here, but it brings up the question to me as I was looking at the at the graphs that um, I could not tell um, how much, other than intergovernmental funds that we received, how much we received in like grants, uh, because they could be substantial or they may not be substantial and they could be an additional source of revenue, or they may not be. But I'm just kind of curious, you know, if, there, if that is a source of revenue that we have not explored. It is a significant source of revenue in, in this year and last year's CIP, specifically for the US 33 State Route 161 project. There's a significant amount of ODOT and, and uh, federal money in that program. I would say, generally speaking, in an operating budget perspective, we have not been successful giving grant, uh, receiving grants. Um, our, we just have not seen success in that arena. On the capital side, we've seen more success. We were able to leverage a state capital grant of $400,000 for the log cabin restoration. So when we have interesting and cool projects like that, where the state capital budget is kind of interested in those kind of unique things, um, we have been successful. Uh, I know we're currently exploring some grants for water and sewer extensions and have, have worked with the Franklin County engineer to, to put our name on the list on those. And, and we have some success in the transportation arena with regard to those types of grants. Um, but operating grants have been hard to come by. And, the, and just quickly, the only thing that I, I would like to in the future see who, you know, how many grants we've, we've written and, and in what departments we've written them from because I know parks, I know art, I know um, historic preservation. There, there's a variety of resources there, and I'm just wondering if we're taking full advantage of them. So, for future discussion. You know, all I would add is when we look at the debt profile, and thank you for putting this graph together dating back to 1991. If you look at 2000, which was our last high water mark prior to 2017, from 2000 to 2020, we essentially doubled our debt. Um, and I think the juxtaposition from this debt profile to, uh, if you could forward it one, to this, so, you know, this is a five-year CIP, so this takes us out to 2026, which is essentially the high water mark on, on this proposed CIP debt service analysis. And what we know to be true is we're going to want to do more CIP things than we have funds for, so that, that will continue to go up. Um, you know, I, I agree with Kathy of, I really like the analogy of making the run up the hill and paying it down and making a run up the hill. I, I don't see where the top of the hill is for us to start paying it down here, given the things that we're talking about doing. Um, I don't know what we do about it because there, you know, I don't know that many of us want to take out the red pen and start crossing things off the CIP. But I, you know, at some point you have to start paying it down. Um, and, and I appreciate that this graph is set for current conditions, but kind of everything after 2026 you kind of have to squint your eyes and look at it blurry because the, that's only if we don't do anything else and we all know better than that. So 
um, I think it's an important conversation to have and understand, you know, what do we want to fund out of reserves and, and what we want to debt fund. Councilmember Keeler, to follow up on your comment and to just add a little bit of context here, it's, it's, it's even a little bit better than two to one, right? Because we're thinking two to one, you're thinking two to one in terms of income tax. And as this graph demonstrates, TIFs actually fund a significant portion of our debt service payments. And indeed, frankly, that's one of the best utilizations of our tax increment financing because it comes in slowly over 30 years. It's hard to build up a fund balance in a time frame because if you build up a fund balance but haven't identified a project, people start to wonder, why are you hoarding money? What are you going to do with it? When are you going to do something with it? So there starts to be kind of a self-reinforcement of the more tax increment financing you get, the more types of debt you can pay off. You start to free up more income tax to do the cash funding that I think some of these projects that we're discussing today start to become a reality. For example, you know, funding the, the park, at least at this point, we've made a decision to advance it and likely will be able to cash fund it, you know, with the income tax situation. That's really a result of identifying other TIF funds to supplant what would have been income tax funding and free that money up. So I would expect that to continue as we continue to develop and continue to create new TIFs, that that orange bar will continue to grow. Even if we don't change the green line at all, we will become more and more um, diversified in our revenue sources to pay TIFs and create more and more capacity in our debt policy, freeing up the opportunity to cash fund or to make that, that big splash if that's what we're interested in future years. Hey, Matt, the only thing I meant to mention and I, I, I failed to do so is um, income tax revenue and the instability really for the first time that that's become part of the conversation this year, right? Because there are so many unknowns, not only our ability to collect it, um, but you know, is that how the state house sees municipalities funded into the future? Um, which is a very different conversation. And I suppose I, the second half of what I intended to say was, um, you know, what happens if we don't, if we, use, if we lose the yellow bar. Um, it, now, granted, it could be replaced by another bar, right? They're, they're going to give us a, a vehicle to be funded. We don't, you know, it, and it very well may be income tax, but it very well could be something, something else to be known at a later date. So I would only hesitate us. In, in Andy's um, situation, we're kind of may, maybe looking at a retirement situation uh, that would be early you know, where our, our ability to raise funds or get income could be significantly altered. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mary. You definitely get no argument from me that there's uncertainty and instability in our income tax revenue and, and likely will be for the next 12 to 18 months, if not longer. Um, I, I would just put forth that you know, the, bar, the, the, the debt capacity is currently at 50%. So while there would have to be an in impact, obviously it would have to be a pretty significant impact, impacting debt service will be one of many problems we have when we were in that world, and I hope we don't have to worry about how to solve them. I, I would just say again, um, if, if you look at the amount of debt relative to our income sources and even the income tax source, which is sort of in danger or in question, it's not gonna go to zero. So, you know, all of these different facets of the income, none of them are going to zero. Um, I go back to my, my couple that buys a $500,000 house, $480,000 mortgage, something like that, and their annual income is $200,000, and they have one or possibly two sources of income, and publicly traded banks that are regulated by the federal government are willing to loan that couple, that $480,000. So it's a very calculated risk. Um, so again, I, I'm an advocate of setting limits and I, I totally agree with the comments that Kathy made. It goes up, it goes down. When it goes down, it, gives, it affords us the flexibility to take on more debt down the line. Um, but I would also go back, go back to 2008, 2010, 2012, 
interest rates were absurdly low at that time. So prior councils were, in my opinion, savvy in that that was the time to take on more debt because the rates were so low. Yeah, so I, I agree with what you're saying, Andy. I think uh, that's, you know, when rates are low, that's when you want to take advantage of it for sure. And we do have a debt policy. That's why we created the debt policy, so that we would not go beyond what we felt the appropriate levels were ever. Um, and, I, and I think we have discussed that debt policy, and it should always be on the docket to review at any time, right? But that is something that we created and we put together for the purpose of doing exactly what you just said. Um, I also agree that debt should go up and down. Um, and if, at a, if there comes a time when, when council feels that our debt uh, profile is too high, but yet it's still underneath our debt policy, then yeah, we should be revisiting our debt policy. And you're right, Chris. You know, it's like you want to get that red pen out and say, okay, well, what can we chop out of here to, right? And that's hard, but those are, those are discussions that we're supposed to be having. So we're having those right discussions. Um, where we are today is not giving me much pause. If we continue sort of on that path, never allowing ourselves to, as you say, go down the hill a bit, I think that is a problem. Um, so it sounds like we're all relatively close to, to being um, in, a, in the same room with each other on this. For sure. So Matt, did you get the guidance you needed? Yes, I just wanted to engage in the conversation. I don't have any policy changes to make, but I appreciate it. Appreciate the discussion and clarification and uh, you know, we can move forward. You know, Matt, and your, the uh, comments you made about um, TIFs and that's why we got into them at the level we did is true. It's going to drive up the other end of the bar. But I also agree with my colleagues that it's also time to can maybe take a look at this since there is this period of uncertainty, see what's really going to happen on our income tax. Thank you. Thank you. On, on that note, just, just out of, I don't know, a point to get to that uncertainty because I believe it is important that you you and I all agree that there's uncertainty. Um, our fund balance at the end of the first year of the CIP is over, I think, $6 million, which gives me, right, we have a five-year plan, but you only execute one year at a time. So the fact that the, one of the, I think year five has a larger fund balance, but the second largest remaining balance is actually at the end of year one, which is the year we're actually going to do. So that gives me a fair amount of confidence that we'll be able to execute on the first year, continue to see what this new normal brings us, and then continue to adjust the 2022 or 2023 and future CIPs when we know more. But that that first year of the CIP is pretty well secured by being essentially overfunded by about six million dollars, which helps me to you know kind of navigate that uncertainty a little bit. Okay, moving on to the sewer and water fund discussion. I wanted to have this discussion. There were some questions about sewer and water revenues, and I just wanted to uh, kind of go into some detail on where these funds are at. I think the history kind of guides how did we get here, and I think in these, this case, it's kind of an interesting story. Um, what are we doing, and then what is the result of what we're doing ultimately going to mean policy-wise so that we can kind of check in on that. So this is a different color coding than the previous. This is, uh, you know, light colors represent the water fund, dark colors represent transfers from the CIP as a funding source, so you can kind of acclimate yourself. And then the green funding is cash, and the brown funding is debt. So you can kind of see there's a lot of debt funding up there, there's a lot of cash funding, what's the breakdown between maintenance and, and CIP projects. It's important to see here that for the water fund, I have programmed debt funding for the Tartan West and Post Road Booster Station upgrade of 525,000 and debt funding the water line replacements in each and every other year. That is a policy change from prior CIPs where we cash funded this and I wanna kinda of do a check in on that uh, at the end of this presentation and kind of tell you why that, that change was made and what direction you'd like to move on that. Additionally, this is the, the CIP waterline extensions are fully funded by transfers from the capital improvement funds. And that's important because it negates any impact, any rate impact of the water fund of these extensions. If we had to have the fund paying for it, we'd have to increase revenues to the fund. So that's the important policy implication there. And I just wanted you to see kind of where these are at for the water fund. 
and for the sewer fund. The sewer fund has a little bit different uh, activity going on, as has been done previously. We are debt funding the one and a half million dollars every other year for sanitary sewer lining and repair. We're also debt funding the large uh, projects, the Avery Road Relief Sewer and the Glick Road Relief Sewer, are debt funded design and construction from the sewer fund. So this is an instance where we're debt funding design. And I want to you know, follow up on that as well. The reason we're doing that is to better align uh, revenues towards expenditures so we don't see a large fund balance drop as we continue to move through this CIP. So this kind of gives you a, an outline of the funding sources, where they're coming from, and how they're programmed. I want to kind of give some, some information here. This is the allocations page where you can see where we've allocated for sewer and water the amounts from the capital improvements tax fund, so income tax dollars, to both of these enterprise funds to support the utility extensions. That's design and debt payments when uh, we're debt funding construction. So just some graphical information to kind of walk through the sewer and water fund revenues, expenditures, and fund balance from a historical perspective. This is the sewer fund revenue, and, and the sewer and water fund revenues are very similar. The blue is the user surcharges, so those are the fee per thousand cubic feet of water usage. The darker orange are the tap fees. Those are the connection fees that you pay to the system. You can see the connection fees would obviously, as you would expect, be very large very early in the system's life and then kind of taper off. You can also see the impact of Bridge Park on the connection fees kind of in that late 2016, 17, 18 uh, time period. Those green bars represent transfers for the future years in the CIP, the last five years, those are transfers from the capital improvements tax fund in order to pay for the utility extension. So they will make up a significant portion of the sewer funds revenue moving forward. The other interesting thing to note is that revenues haven't really changed over the life, which is pretty extensive for the sewer fund. They were over $3 million in 1999 and they didn't eclipse that money without counting bond proceeds until like a year ago. So this is a very flat funded fund essentially, which is not what you would expect for something 20 years old. You would expect to see a steady increase. On the expenditure side, the blue is the operating expenditures. So these are the, the, the expenditures for the people and products to maintain the system on a daily basis. Orange are the capital expenditures. So those are the projects that we typically cash fund and then you can see the sewer fund has a significant amount of debt expenses. Those were the upper Scioto branch connector was the largest capital project in the city's history until Bridge Park. So that is coming out of this fund and, and was a significant investment. Graphing these together, you can see the blue line represents revenues, the orange line represents expenditures, and you can see that a majority of the fund balance was earned in that early time period and to the most part, expenditures have exceeded revenues in more years than not since about that 2000 time frame. Hopefully my projections for the CIP are a little conservative and we'll see those revenues and expenditures flip. Hopefully that's a conservative estimate. In terms of fund balance impact, you can see this a little bit more kind of obviously here. The green lines on the top graph represent years where the fund balance grows, where the red bars represent years where it decreases, and the actual fund balance is displayed in the bottom. So you can see, other than the very early years of the sewer fund and some very large tap fee years from the construction of Bridge Park, the sewer fund has basically been on a downward trend since about 2001. This is not a new phenomenon. And you can see the fund balance below kind of staying at that reduced level. In terms of rates, so the CIP is not just a collection of projects. It obviously also has to have revenue sources attached to it. So I wanted to be clear that the relief sewers and the sanitary sewer lining, the funding that it's coming from the sewer fund as currently programmed, would lead to a rate increase of greater than inflation. So currently, the proposed sewer rate increase for next year would be 4%. And that would be 4% uh, modeled every year through the end of the CIP in 2026. Those rates for 2020 would have been 1235, for 2021 would be 1275, and for 22 would be 1326. And you can see here the, histor the historical um, comparison of where the rates have been. We had them flat for several years and began raising them last year with a 3% increase. 
So what are the policy considerations here? So the first one is that the sewer extensions are funded 100% through transfers. There's no impact on the sewer rates due to the extension program. So that 4% impact is a result of what's in that second bullet point there, which is the growing rate pressure from debt service costs in the sewer fund. We've done a million and a half in sewer lining and repairs every year since 2015. We've had $3.5 million for the deer run sanitary sewer improvements, and we have almost $8 million in relief sewers programmed in this CIP. The revenues to the sewer fund are, are, are not significant in terms of ongoing, that, that uh, operating that blue line grows very slowly. So it, it takes quite a bit in order to make up some of these debt service costs. So future extensions from the CIP will cost 950,000 annually. That's the last number in the allocations. And then future extensions uh, per the sewer, fund, sewer and water extension policy are estimated to cost about $2.1 million. So we'll add an additional $100,000 annually to that if they are in fact debt financed. And I would caution to say that those numbers are a few years old. I would be surprised if that ends up being accurate if we don't see that inflate a little bit. Uh, but those are the best numbers we have today. All of this is to say that the sewer fund balance is not anticipated to increase during this CIP. It's actually projected to decrease a little bit. Um, this will put continuous pressure on rates to maintain a stable fund balance and will in indeed put increasing pressure on those rates. Um, if those sewers come in over budget or the project begins to grow, I would not be surprised if we have to do greater than 4% in future years in order to keep the fund balance from, from declining. Matt, you know, we had the conversation at the public services about the uh, sewer and water. And um, if um, a policy about extensions um, with sewer and water changes it that we extend out farther or we allow, as we're looking into, the possibility that people can choose to maintain an independent uh, water and, and septic tank system on their property under certain restrictions and guidelines, um, what do you, how impactful would that be on that rate increase percentage? It, it, it will have no impact on the, the sewer extension and the water extensions are completely separate because we funded them exclusively through income tax. Right. So we can do no more than fully fund them to support them not impacting ratepayers, which is what I understand to be the policy direction that this council gave uh, previously when, when discussing this program. So this is the execution of that. The rate increase is really a reflection of, you know, it's been flat for 20 years and now we have a substantial amount of debt. It was able to support some of this earlier debt because the upper Scioto branch connector debt had rolled off. But now we're approaching the same level of debt service as had previously rolled off. And you saw those few flat years of sewer rates probably should have been inching those up. What I'm trying to avoid is a year where I have to come before you and, and really increase rates. So I want to try to do a slow, methodical, planned approach. And I want to talk that through with you, obviously, to make sure you understand, is that right? And, and, and what does that look like? So that's really putting the pressure on the rates. The, the extension program is really completely separate because of the way we funded it. And I know it's cash funded, and I know that it comes from our income tax. But if we were to divert some of the the money allotted through the cash funding to reduce debt, I guess what I'm I, I guess what I'm asking it, it it seems like the increase of four percent higher than inflation could be, you know, seemed you know seem a little oppressive to people. I don't really know. Um, but is there any way that that you could balance it so the rate increase still gave you the level of funding that you needed for the debt service, but would not necessarily, um, you know, you know, I guess more flexibility in how we used uh, the way we're managing these dollars? I guess I would say that it is probably technically possible to transfer income tax dollars to pay for those sewer projects, such as the relief sewers but it, it would be highly unusual. Generally, enterprise funds are expected to you know, support themselves, support and themselves. It, would be, it would be unusual. Okay, thank you. Matt, I don't necessarily think that 4% is gonna be greater than the rate of inflation for the next several years. 
Fair enough. I, I think that inflation is going to be greater than that, and particularly when you talk about inflation relative to productive activities, i.e., the lining of water and you know new water lines and the lining of sewer systems. I think, I think our cost is going to be greater than four percent more than it was. So I, I'm perfectly comfortable with the number of four percent because I think inflation is going to be. I think we're going to be under the rate of inflation. I, to Chris, I agree with you 100%, and I'm very comfortable with this proposal. Um, yeah, I, I, I reflect on the conversation we had about the rec center funding, no change for a long time, and then had to make it an, a, a huge jump, which, you know, I wasn't real excited about at the time. And I think uh, a, a steady, you know, 4% is a bit much, but I, the costs are probably reflecting that. Um, People can predict that, people can manage that versus a huge jump that we saw later. So I, I think that your recommendation, Sloan said is that with the work you said, um, probably makes sense in this. Appreciate your work on it. Okay, thank you. So I'll spend a little less time on the water fund because it's very similar, but a little healthier, a little different scenario in terms of water fund revenues. Um, a little bit flatter and more consistent. There was some early uh, fire hydrant permits and then a little bit more transfers and advances having to do with the development out at Tartan West. The Tartan West TIF and the Water Fund have been transferring money back and forth um, as one as development occurs. So that's some of the transfers and, the, and a little bit of uniqueness in that Water Fund. In terms of expenditures, a much more consistent expenditure. Again, it hasn't had the debt service, so it, it hasn't seen um, some of the expenditures that the sewer fund has. In terms of uh, revenues over expenditures, you can again see though that the most consistent time where the revenues exceeded the expenditures was in the early years of the fund development. And again, it gets a little, a little more choppy as time has gone by. And once again, I hope I'm a little conservative and that blue line gets above the orange line for the, for the remainder of the CIP. In terms of fund balance, you could see that the green lines on the top do extend farther. Um, and they are a little bit more randomly distributed, so that's a good thing to note. The only part that I think is important to note on this slide is that the fund balance has remained relatively flat, ever so slightly receding over time. And that's only a problem in the context that our fund balance policy is for 25 per, it's our unofficial, I shouldn't say a fund balance policy, we've never voted on it, but it's been in previous CIPs and discussed as the fund balance target which would be 25% of system replacement value, which ends up being about $16 million. So this fund balance is not problematic, except for that policy, which is kind of why I want to have this discussion, because I want to know how to prioritize that moving forward. Um, in terms of water rates, you can actually see we've deflated water rates pretty consistently. Um, and we've just now begun in this CIP, I am programming 3%, which I consider inflationary, but to the mayor's point, that might be a little bit outdated, unfortunately, but previously inflationary rate of 3%, um, and that says sewer, but it should be water, and they're modeled at 3% thereafter. So the water fund faces less rate pressure, particularly depending on this fund balance conversation, as it does have a fund balance of over $12 million, which is more than double the sewer fund's about $6 million fund balance. So water extensions are once again 100% funded through transfers from the capital improvement funds. There's no impact on the water rates. The CIP extensions will cost $250,000 annually. An additional $45,000 of debt service will be incurred as these extensions are completed in the years that are not programmed in the CIP. I think the important policy consideration here is the water fund is utilizing debt financing to pay for capital improvements instead of cash funding the projects such as the water line replacement and the booster station. And it's doing that to better align them with revenues, meaning that revenues come in slowly over time. This revenue 3% increases slowly over time. This debt service will only allow us to pay it back over a 20 year period. Instead of having the water fund recede another $2 million over the life of this CIP further away from its stated policy goal of 16 million. Um, so that's why the water fund is programmed that way. Um, the water fund is not anticipated. The fund balance, even utilizing debt financing, is not projected to increase. It's projected to stay pretty flat at that inflationary number. 
but utilizing the debt financing instead of cash financing keeps it from being reduced further as we uh, work towards hitting that fund balance goal. Um, with that, I'm available for any questions. I think we're ready. Okay, great. Couple of additional questions and follow up in the 10 minutes we have. There was some conversation about fund balance. So I wanted to put it together, a quick slide on fund balance policy. The first column is the original fund balance. This represents the CIP that was approved, the revenues that were approved, the expenditures. You had an unencumbered fund balance uh, at the beginning of this year of just under $20 million, that $19.9 million. But that's not entirely accurate as there were projects that were not completed or not fully encumbered last year and they need to be accounted for in that fund balance. Those projects totaled about $9 million. So we had a, an unencumbered, unallocated, unassigned, completely available fund balance of about $10.9 million. We've executed some supplemental ordinances that uh, executed on some of those carryover projects in order to, the South High Street Trees, for example, was a carryover project that was then appropriated. So we've executed about $3.4 million in projects, uh, $3.1 million of which was carryover. That brings us to the revised column. So that's the column with which we kind of look forward and, and prospectively say, well, what's different? The first column in that, the first number in that estimates of 428,000, that is a reduction in previously encumbered funds that were not needed to complete the project. So what happens on a lot of these projects, we will encumber an amount and then begin executing and then when the year's over and the work's essentially done, there's still money remaining and we just close the POs. It's kind of counterintuitive, but construction POs generally close with a balance remaining because you can't go over legally, and when they adjust the quantities, there tends to be, they tend to overestimate, and then you end up unencumbering the funds and releasing them back into the fund balance. So that's uh, predominantly what that number is represented by. We had $2.3 million in revenue that is not currently budgeted, so a majority of that is actually the income tax growth that we've seen. We had a budget estimate that this CIP was based on of 90.2. We're at 94, so we can, see some increased uh, tax revenue. Projects unlikely to move forward, 1.4 million. One million of that was actually land acquisition. We have a million dollars in land acquisition. I, I haven't heard any discussions of utilizing that, so I've pushed it forward so that we can utilize it and create that fund balance. So instead of starting next year at half a million, we'll start next year at one and a half million. We'll just appropriate it as part of the process so we don't have to do a supplemental every year. So. A majority of that is uh, that project. The 412,000 is projects that have been completed or bid under budget. We, we, we all know we've seen a lot of under budgets this year. It's been a really good bidding year. The final is the reduction in carryover budgets. This one is um, the most interesting category. So of that $4.7 million, $2 million is uh, for the Avery Shire Rings Road roundabout. It was for land acquisition last year. We ended up deciding not to do a roundabout and went with a uh, traditional intersection, meaning that we freed up that $2 million in land acquisition. That's a majority of that funding. Additionally, there's another million dollars um, that was budgeted for street maintenance. Now, you will notice if you read the capital status uh, report that we're a million dollars over in street maintenance. The increase in that funding is being funded by uh, underages or future carryovers in this budget. So that million dollars can be released because it will be encumbered as a carryover in a, in a future year. So essentially, these, these projects can kind of leapfrog through time and we kind of keep track of that in the carryover. It's not that an additional million dollars of street maintenance didn't occur, it's that it didn't need additional budget to occur. And that's a majority of, of that funding. So I'm, I'm available to answer any questions if there are any additional comments on that. Comments? So the long and the short of this is um, we're, I look at the very bottom line, we're, we're starting $9 million better off than we thought we were going to, going into this calendar year. That's correct. So this allows us to talk about less debt financing, doing some of those things. Now, you've incorporated that whole 19 in your plan already, right? Correct. But I think as we talk about and look forward to that, uh, 
I, I think we're going to continue this conversation during the council meeting. I, I think it's interesting to see that it's, it's these opportunities, I think, that we can take to our advantage when we talk about being able to come down off that hill a little bit. So thank you. A couple of updates on previously discussed items. We just wanted to provide some quick updates on the Coda bus shelter. Uh, council requested the addition of text addressing technology and inquir inquired about discussions with the Public Service Committee. Staff reviewed those meeting notes and found that there was some discussion as it relates to the Mobility Hub at the May 3rd meeting. Um, but we're going to bring the project scope and detail uh, with the Public Services Committee in an upcoming meeting to ensure that the technology conversation is, is addressed. And we'll continue to coordinate this project with CODA as project details are developed. Uh, staff will also share information and potential designs with the Public Service Committee for their review and consideration. And then with the Franklin Street improvements, there was some conversation about the specifics of that project. And staff will remove the language citing uh, the project details and specifications and leave it a little bit more of a general description in order to facilitate um, some additional conversation on that. So those are the two project descriptions that we are changing uh, with your approval for the uh, next CIP hearing. The only other, um, and th that's fine. of capital assets would be in the capital budget. It is the capital budget. In right. parks. In parks, yeah. In parks. Unless it's related to staffing of maintenance no, activities. No, it, it so has to operation. do with assets. Okay. And I think it's on, um, it's in section seven. So I don't know whether. I have one more substantive right. slide and then I'm, I'm complete. Okay. Not that that should override your concerns, know, but just to fine. give you an update. If I just didn't know where we brought in any of the additional comments. Thank you. Go ahead. So my final slide is there was a discussion about the Dublin Springs uh, park improvements. I'm not going to read the slide for brevity, but it discussed the improvements that were discussed there. Just looking for a yes or no on whether or not to include that project. At $100,000, it does fit into this CIP without requiring any additional project cuts um, at that level programmed in the first year. So if council would like to proceed with that, happy to do so. If you'd like to not, then happy to not uh, include it as well. I think that we were all interested in seeing those amenities at the Dublin Springs Park. Throw something at me if I'm wrong. My only comment is, is it's in the historic district, obviously, and the Spring Park improvements need to, have, need to happen. Um, don't, are we absolutely tied to these um, specifications or is that open for um, design? I'd say it's open for design. I think that's the important thing. Yeah. Okay. It floods easily so some of these things wouldn't stay there very long. <laughs> okay. Um, unless it's council uh, wishes otherwise, we were going to not vote on this this evening. We were going to wait for a return on the packet in its entirety with any of the changes uh, for example, like we talked about the Parkland Acquisition Fund, um, so that we have the, the document we're voting on finalized. So um, that will be the intention in the council meeting. And then I suppose that would allow some time, Jane, if you had some questions to reach out to Matt to understand um, what those additional questions are you might have. You know, I think it's, it's simply, um, as I looked over the maintenance, we've talked a lot about... Um, the assets, and, and I'm not talking operating maintenance, I'm talking about the assets that we have here in the park systems. Um, and as by those I, assets, you mean like play structures, or give me some yeah, examples? All the solid things, play structures, park benches, I, a, a variety of things. Um, but what I noticed here was that the, um, the ask, um, or the, in this year, or in this next five years, is um, under um, park renovations and rehabilitations is averaging about a million. Um, but f a few years back in 2017, 
the ask was for 1.4 million. That was in 2017. It was reduced uh, to $800,000. And that was probably when we had a lot of other things going on. But my concern is, and, I, and I'd really like to hear um, from Matt or whoever um, could uh, speak to this. Now, um, it's, about a mil it's about a million, but we have added so many parks to the system. We've added Ferris Wright, Riverside Crossing, the Veterans Park, the landscaping there, Kaufman Park expansion, the corners, the riverfront and its waterways, um, the John Shields Park, so many. And I do um, wonder if we are allowing, um, well, I, well, first and foremost, it's, I wonder if we're allowing enough money for those assets. But secondly, I'd just like to ask if we do an asset management evaluation like we do for streets and utilities, because I do think that we have a lot more than we did before, and we reduced the levels. I could not find in 2017 or before how much money we allocated to CIP park maintenance. I couldn't, I couldn't find the information on it, but I know in 2017 the ask was one, almost one and a half million, and it was reduced by 800,000. So I have a feeling there's a need out there for a little bit more park maintenance money, but I don't know for sure. Okay, well, the good news is, is that we're, we, this is on the agenda for this evening, and if we have a few outstanding questions, let's go ahead and leave it on the agenda tonight, and then we'll do the reading, and we'll ask for questions, and then we'll have opportunity to discuss this uh, during the, that portion of the meeting tonight, which will allow us to get on with the business that we have in executive session and still keep us on pace, if that's all right with everyone. Sounds good. Okay. Um, then I will make a motion that we adjourn to executive session for personnel matters considering the employment of a public employee in conferences with an attorney for the public body concerning disputes involving the public body that are the subject of pending or imminent court action. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Jenny, would you please call the roll? Ms. Saluto? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mayor Ambrose Grooms? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Great, and as a reminder to all, we will reconvene in this format at 7 p.m. Okay, we will reconvene the um, August 30th Dublin City Council meeting. And uh, we have two wrestlers here this evening that we're going to recognize. And I would ask if you two gentlemen would like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Our first proclamation is going to be uh, for Ty Wilson. So, Ty, if you would meet me right here, I will be down there momentarily. How are you this evening? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Oh, there it is. Well, we have a lot to celebrate in you this evening. You have been up to some wonderful things, huh? Yes. Well, we have a proclamation for you because uh, the Dublin community is so proud of you. And the proclamation reads as follows. Whereas Dublin Scioto High School student Ty Wilson won the 2021 Ohio High School Athletic Association Division I State Wrestling Championship for the 113 weight pound class. Whereas as a freshman wrestler, Ty said he wanted to make his name known and become the next multiple state champion. 
And whereas he had an outstanding season with a 95.1% winning percentage and 25 pins in techs, and whereas Ty finished the season 39-2 and two, with his only two losses to Dublin Kaufman wrestler Omar Ayub in the sectional and district tournaments, and whereas the state championship was a rematch <laughs> between the two Dublin wrestlers, with Ty avenging the previous losses and scoring with a three to nothing win. And whereas following his state title, Ty, Ty also placed first for the 16 and under at the 2021 Ohio Greco-Roman State Wrestling Championship. Now therefore I, Chris Amrose Grooms, Mayor of the City of Dublin, Ohio, on behalf of Dublin City Council, do hereby proclaim Friday, September 3rd, 2021 as Ty Wilson Day. In the city of Dublin and extend our congratulations to Ty Wilson in honor of his recognition as an Ohio State High School Wrestling Champion signed this 30th day of August 2021. So congratulations. Thank you. Would you like to share a few words with us? I would just like to thank everyone for welcoming me here today. And I would also like to thank my family, friends, and teammates for helping me through the pain and sacrifice I made through the whole season this year. Well, thanks, buddy. We're certainly proud of you. Next, we have Seth Schumont. Did I pronounce that correctly? Schumate. Well, welcome. Come on up. We have a proclamation for you as well, and it reads as follows. Whereas Dublin Kaufman High School student Seth Schumate won the 2021 Ohio High School Athletic Division I State Wrestling Championship for the 195-pound weight class in March, and whereas it was a repeat victory for Seth, who won the title in 2019 as a freshman and remained the defending champion after last year's tournament was canceled due to COVID-19. And whereas he pinned his opponent in one minute and 42 seconds, <laughs> took me that long to walk down here, to win this year's state title and finish the season with 30 wins and one loss despite suffering a knee injury in January. And whereas Seth helped his Kaufman High School team win its third straight district title and a program best third place finish in the state team tournament February 6th. And whereas now a junior, he currently ranks fifth in the country. And whereas Seth was a runner up in the junior freestyle competition at the US Marine Corps Junior and U16 National Championships in Fargo, North Dakota in July. And whereas last year, Seth made a verbal commitment to the Ohio State University and plans to be part of the incoming class of the 2022 Buckeyes wrestling team. Now, therefore, I, Chris Amrose, Grooms Mayor of the City of Dublin, Ohio, on behalf of Dublin City Council, do hereby proclaim Saturday, September 4th, 2021, as Seth Schumate Day in the City of Dublin and extend our congratulations to Seth in honor of his recognition as an Ohio High School wrestling champion signed this 30th day of August, 2021. Congratulations. Do you have any comments you'd like to share with us? Um, I'm very grateful to um, live in this uh, supportive community and, um, and where I get to represent Dublin. And um, I hope to leave a culture here for upcoming athletes and students to, uh, you know, do their best and work their hardest to represent the city of Dublin. Well, we couldn't be more proud of both you guys. Congratulations. If you'd like to stay for a really thrilling city council meeting, uh, feel free to do so. Okay, um, I do want to take a moment. Um, Dana is is not with us this evening, but he did leave uh, some thoughts about um, this is our with me that this was our last meeting prior to the 20th anniversary of September 11th. 
So I just wanted to read a few thoughts, um, you know, to make sure that we recognize this time. Um, and so before we move on to other, other items on tonight's agenda, I think it's important that we pause and reflect uh, as we mark a really solemn anniversary for our nation. Uh, it is difficult to believe that it has been, in fact, 20 years since the September 11th terrorist attack that took the lives of nearly 3,000 people from 78 different countries. Much has been written and many words have been spoken in the two decades that have passed since that dreadful day. And words still cannot adequately convey the feelings of confusion, helplessness, anger, fear, and loss brought upon by those devastating events. Ultimately, the World Trade Center Twin Towers collapsed, killing more than 2,000 people, including 343 firefighters and paramedics, 23 New York City police officers, and 37 Port Authority police officers. 125 military personnel and civilians were killed at the Pentagon, along with 64 people aboard the airliner. And all 44 people aboard Flight 93 were killed. It is one of those moments everyone can cer certainly of a certain age can instantly recall and remember where they were when they learned of the attacks. After the attacks in uh, 2001, now retired Dublin Police Sergeant Craig Hungler traveled to New York City with two other area police chaplains to counsel survivors. Retired Washington Township firefighter Matt Modlick also traveled to New York with Task Force One for two weeks to assist and rescue with rescue and recovery efforts. Today and every day, we thank those who have served and continue to serve our, in our armed forces. We honor those who paid the ultimate sacrifice to ensure our nation's security and to work to bring stability to the Afghan people. And we look forward to the day when peace prevails over terror. To mark the anniversary, Washington Township will hold a memorial ceremony beginning at 9.59 Saturday, September 11th <clears throat> at the 9-11 Memorial in front of Station 93 on Brand Road. The memorial's focal point is a piece of I-beam from one of the World Trade Towers. The memorial uh, was completed in the summer of 2003 and is open to the public 365 days a year. It was a labor of love for the two men who spearheaded the project for the Washington Township Fire and Dublin Police Departments in memory of all the dedicated servicemen and women who lost their lives on September 11, 2001. As we approach this somber anniversary, I encourage each of us to take time to reflect and remember and to certainly thank those who paid the ultimate price. Uh, with that, we will move on um, to citizen comments. Is there anyone present this evening that would like to make comment on any item that is not on this evening's agenda? Okay, uh, Lindsay, have we received any remote? Thank you very much. Okay, consent agenda. There is a request uh, to, is there a request to remove any item from this evening's consent agenda? Hearing none, uh, I will make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Christina. Um, Jenny, would you please call the roll? Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mayor Ambrose Grooms? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Ms. Aludo? Yes. Okay, brings us to second reading public hearing ordinances, ordinance 43-21. Adopting the 2022 through 2026 five-year capital improvements program. Okay, and Mr. Stifler, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. With our Good staff evening. report. We won't enter it in any races, will we? Need some Jeopardy music maybe while the screen comes down. I'd sing, but then you'd all leave. Okay, Matt, please take it away. Good evening, members of council. Uh, we had a robust discussion on several pending items for the CIP earlier this evening. As such, staff uh, recommends that you postpone the second hearing and vote on this legislation until the next meeting, which would be the first meeting in September. With that, I'm available to answer any additional questions on this legislation that you might have. 
Very good, thank you. I wanna take a moment if there is public comment this evening on the CIP. Lindsay, have we received any remote comments? Great, thank you. Okay, council questions, discussion. Jane? Yes, I, you know, I, I'd like to um, discuss with council one of the items on the CIP, which is concerning um, the line item for maintenance of, of park assets. I think you'll find it under parks, under, um, I think it's AR 221, park renovations rehabilitation. Um, I just noticed as I was looking back historically, um, parks are, our park assets are, are one of the most valued aspects of the community and a very high priority for uh, many of our citizens. And I noticed that um, we have increased the funding, which I appreciate, and I think that's very important. But um, over the years, um, back in 2017, the funding request was for $1,400,000 a year, but it wasn't approved at that time. It was reduced to $800,000. And, and, and so that, that makes us, even in 2017 with today's dollars, you know, short by about $3,500 a year. Um, over the last five years, we've added quite a few parks, Ferris Wright, the Riverside Crossing Park, the Veterans uh, Grounds of Remembrance, landscaping there, uh, an expansion in Kaufman Park, Skate Park, tennis courts. We have the corners that will be developed here pretty quickly. Um, the riverfront, we have the 2035 plan with some discussions about, um, you know, uh, new greenways. Um, we've had additional development green space given to us. There is just, and the John Shields Park, there's just a lot of new parks. But if I look at the funding on maintenance, um, and rehabilitation and renovation, it's not keeping up with the rate of our increases in these amenities. And so one of my questions is, um, do we, like streets and utilities, do an asset uh, evaluation? Do we have an asset, a park asset evaluation um, summary done to kind of make sure that we keep on top of of the rehabilitation needs because just adding dollars to something is um, annually is helpful, but does it really allow us to understand if we're maintaining them to the quality that they need to be maintained? And also a summary as to are we offering in the way of, of capital improvements the amenities that the, um, that the public is expecting? Like we made a change to do pickleball courts because everybody wanted pickleball courts and we, we decided not to do a, a platform tennis court. So I'm just wondering if there's any kind of a evaluation done, if we have a consultant or any kind of an asset management program when it comes to parks and CIP. So I can take an initial stab at answering this question and then either Matterman or Robert can chime in and elaborate. Um, but yes, we do take... Uh, a look at all of our assets in our parks every year in preparation for the CIP and our funding request each year is based on those inspections. Um, regarding our formal asset management program, um, you know, that's been in place for about five, six years now and we have incorporated one by one each of the assets associated with transportation system, utilities. So we definitely have the process and um, much more information as it relates to those assets and we are in the process of and will be incorporating all of our park assets into our formal citywide asset management program over the next year or so. So our parks um, department has been working with Bob Taylor who spearheads that asset management program to start incorporating our park assets and so we will have a lot more information next year and we'll be making you know very strategic decisions about the timing uh, and the um, scope of the maintenance that's performed on our park assets um, in future CIPs. But, you know, the information or the funding that we're requesting at this time is based on the information that we have now. And that will, I guess I should add, you know, as part of a CIP follow-up memo that we provided um, kind of explaining our funding requests and trends in with our streets, many of the same variables apply to our parks. So, you know, you mentioned... Um, which is a very good point that we continue to add parkland and parks to our inventory. 
um, which definitely will increase our maintenance need, but that'll be over time. So new parks, it takes several years for those new parks to require capital maintenance activities in those. So we won't see that for a little while, but we will start picking up on those as part of our annual inspections. It is the, I understand that we have a whole city asset management, but for a, a, a separate department like, like parks, where it would be just as much, I guess I'm also looking at not just rehabilitation but, and renovation, but also whether the amenity is outdated or it needs to be abandoned for something different, a kind of a more uh, department specific mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of thing. And I don't, I don't know if that's something yeah, and, and those funding requests come from several different places. So, you know, as we hear from residents or we hear from HOAs or civic associations throughout the years, our parks um, department will vet those types of requests and include those in requests as part of CIP budget process every year. And then, as was mentioned earlier, we are going through the parks master plan update. So some of those might come to bear um, through that process as well. Would there be consideration for... I mean, I know that, as my question was before, it, I know that you have a general and you say that you're adding the parks um, to the asset management program. It's not completed yet. Is that something, which is preferable to, to, to combine it all in under one city asset management or to be more specific to parks? I, you know, I'm just- So curious. Robert might want to chime in at this point, but Bob Taylor and his division report directly to Robert. And my focus or my ask of, of Bob Taylor when he was hired five or six years ago was that he begin with incorporating the transportation assets because those are our largest assets, the pavements and things like that. So he one by one incorporated roads, curbs, um, ramps, all of those assets, and then he moved on and started working on utilities, and now he's working into parks. So he's kind of central to many of the departments and divisions that fall under Robert's purview. Um, so I think that's good from a maintenance planning perspective. He has that expertise for um, maintenance activities. As far as new capital requests and amenities and things like that, those typically would be generated by the individual departments. Yeah, just to elaborate, um, and, and, and to your question, question, Councilmember Fox, I think that what Bob brings to the table and what he leads is, is really a methodology and a way of going about asset management. But when it comes specifically to parks or other specific assets of the city, we rely on the subject matter experts to help us actually perform the asset uh, maintenance and management. And, and what I should say, too, is you're definitely right that parks is unique in that it you know, a street is a street, and we haven't invented an amazing new uh, street yet, but parks uh, have new amenities that, that come and go, and so certainly we'll work closely with the department to make sure that as um, there's new um, uh, assets that we would like to see in terms of parks amenities, that we'll do that. And the parks master plan will definitely help us do that, and we'll keep up on that as years go by. But we definitely think that there's a benefit to having the asset management and the different formats it takes under one umbrella because it really helps to, A, it brings a certain level of, of expertise and a methodology to it, um, but B, it helps us to combine all of those assets and look at it holistically as we put together the CIP. So the answer is we're trying to get the best, the best of both worlds out of it in terms of subject specific um, to parks, but also a, a really um, strong asset management focus on it from, from Bob, who really has done a great job with it. You know, I, I, I can see the benefit of that. I think what uh, maybe my question uh, then goes a little bit farther as, like I said, it's, um, I, and maybe Matt can answer this when it comes to the master plan. Um, I guess, as not seeing this grow as much as I would anticipate with all of the growth in parks that we've had with maintenance, it seems to me, especially when the ask was so much higher five years ago, and it hasn't grown even to that ask, that um, whether or not we're um, meeting the, other than getting uh, recommendations from people individually, like we need pickleball courts, uh, sort of this evaluation, not just in rehabilitation, but in amenity abandonment or, or a, a brand new amenity. How do we decide what it is that we want to bring into the park system that maybe we hadn't thought about before other than just an email from someone? So when I talk about um, evaluations, it's more than just simply whether or not it needs to be repaired, 
but is it appropriate? Is it, is it cutting edge? Is it bringing the community the amenity that we're wanting? And, and, uh, and I'm sure that has something to do with the master plan as well, but I'm just, I'm just kind of still a little concerned about the fact that this hasn't seemed to elevate inflated as I would have anticipated. Um, and, I, and, and in fairness, I think that there are some areas of the city that, that probably need a little refreshing when it comes to the capital improvements in the parks. So I don't know if you have anything to... And w one thing that I should add also is, you know, over time, some of our maintenance requests were um, more or less placeholders. So they were based on the number that had been previously requested in previous years or based on us looking back the past four years and taking an average of those four years. And what we've really done with the asset management program is tried very hard to, you know, systematically inspect each of our assets every year and then develop work plans that are specific to those assets. And we have five-year work plans established now. And then we base those requests each year on what those work plans are showing. So we believe that we have, you know, better information, better numbers that we're bringing forward to council each year. And I don't know if Matt, Matt's up there. So Matt will speak to the um, more of the amenities side of things. Okay. When it comes to the park renovations budget, it is more or less related to the maintenance items of existing assets. One of the advantages of going into a new update for our Parks and Recreation Master Plan, you'll recall our current plan is 10 years old. The community has changed from a variety of different levels. Some of those are just the basic needs of the community and the desires of the community from individuals to a collective um, whole of, of many. So <clears throat> any park and recreation update would include a trend analysis, an existing asset analysis, um, um, amenities needs, community needs, focus groups, um, community surveys. The, the conglomerate of all of that will give us a formula in order for us to base does something need to be replaced? We're not using this anymore. The trends are showing that this is something. Pickleball is a perfect example of that, and only in a light speed type of an environment. But that Parks and Recreation Master Plan, I think, is the most in, important tool on a, a more immediate front, and certainly the visioning we have going forward with the 2035 framework plan. So I think the combination of those would work. And you have the funding available to do the, the kind of thing you're talking about? the Parks and Recreation Master Plan update? That in any evaluation or when it comes to this, this CIP, when it comes to whatever is necessary to do the, the evaluation on trends and rehab management and everything, do you have the? That will be there? coming up forward into the operating budget. Okay. Uh, but it is included in the requested funds. Okay, thank you. And then, of course, we would incorporate any recommendations from that master plan into our update next year, which would then be reflected in future years. Andy, did you have a comment? Yeah, I would just say, obviously, the number of parks and the acreage that we have in parkland has increased over time. So naturally, you're going to require more resources. But I think a lot of it is operating versus capital. Megan made the point that many of the parks that we've opened all of the parks that we've opened since 2017, they shouldn't require a capital investment because we just made those investments. So uh, I, I don't disagree that we should see a trend line increasing um, and looking out at the next five years, it appears that they are. So I'm, I think this is consistent with what we need. Thank you, other comments? Okay, uh, other topics? like to discuss yeah Kathy I, I had one that I wanted to, to raise and see what council felt about this um, the um, park at the river crossing park um, the second phase of this is currently scheduled to come in 2025 and we happen to be on the same page as the one Jane had so you'll see that there 5.3 million in 2025 with the planning of that into 2024. This hasn't changed. This is what it was last year, so there, there isn't a change in that. But my question is, um, is there a desire and what would it cost us in terms of a, a shift in plan to move that up one year? And I asked for a couple reasons. 
I know the thinking, and um, I concur with the thinking last year was, well, let's get the park up. Let's see how people use it. Let's see how they feel about it, and then move forward. So um, as I understand it, we're going to open part of that park this fall. I'm getting head nods there and uh, really ready to go next spring. So I think there's going to be a, a, a great desire um, to advance that work of the second part about a year from now or two years from now. So my question, and I sent the question ahead to Matt so uh, I could understand what I was asking. In terms of the plan, in terms of debt financing, in terms of things, if this council should, should, should wish to move it up a year, move the planning up to 2023 and the possible execution in 2024, three years from now, what might that look like? So um, Matt, thank you. Yeah, so with uh, that, policy question, I, I ran some numbers. And at the top, you can see kind of the bottom line of the CIP, how much money is available in each year. That's what the, the lines in gray represent. And you can see that that second year is the limiting year at $173,000. It is the lowest fund balance. So that's the year uh, that tends to limit the remainder of the CIP. In order to move the park forward design and construction by one year, uh, the following changes would need to take place and are um, allowable from a fiscal perspective in, in this current CIP. So there is budget uh, provided the following actions are taken. So you would move 975,000 in design currently cash funded in 2024 to debt funded in 2023. The financing could be reevaluated prior to 2023 as we've done with debt offerings that have come forward. Uh, but for the purposes of budgeting in this CIP, it would need to be debt funded. A absent that, uh, the, a project currently funded in 2023 would need to be moved to 2024 in order to make room for that project to slide into that funding spot. So those are your two kind of policy options for moving that design funding forward. Uh, the fiscal impact is that it would increase estimated uh, debt financing cost $73,000. That's the design cost essentially for the 20 years that that is debt funded uh, should you proceed with debt funding in 2023. Uh, for that 20-year period. It would also increase the cash available in 2024 for the out years in the CIP. There would be an estimated increase in 424,000 in debt financing costs in 2024, essentially moving it forward one year, and a corresponding decrease as that 20th year also moves forward one year. Um, it's not expected to material, I didn't run all the numbers on this, so I'll, uh, but it's not expected to material impact the, the, the debt policy or our debt metrics or our debt profile because we're shifting debt that we currently plan in 2024 forward to 2023. So those are the numbers. That would leave approximately 100,000 in that second year. We moved the uh, Dublin Springs Park forward earlier tonight to 2022, so it would leave a remainder of, of $795 in the budget for that second year. So this project, uh, if moved forward, would, would leave that uh, in the CIP. Thank you, Matt. So uh, one of, as we were having a conversation for an amount of this size, it may very well be that we wouldn't need to debt finance that come 2023, I mean. We have a history of budgeting conservatively, both in terms of revenues and estimates. So while I won't promise anything two years from now, particularly with the uncertainty that exists in income taxes, even if uh, there wasn't funding available to cash fund it, you would have an opportunity with the 2023 CIP to prioritize cash funding it if that was your, your desired intent at that time. So there's at least two opportunities to make a determination, debt or cash financing, once would be the next CIP. And then after that, as we did with the uh, Riverside Crossing Park improvements this year, before issuing the debt, you need to approve an ordinance. We could make a decision to advance debt, f uh, advance fund it for one year and then issue the debt the subsequent year would also be a policy option available. So there are options available to execute this policy. Yeah, it seems to me that is. So I, I just asked Matt, because before I said, you know, what is the appetite to counsel? I think the question was, well, what would, it, what would the implications be? So I don't know how other folks think about that. I just wanted to raise it because it is such a jewel of an asset and it's, you know, it's pretty far out in the plan. So I raised that for 
consideration by this group. You know, I, I agree with you, Kathy. One, we've been under construction so long, and then two, to wait again and then so far out and tear it up again. But my, my ba major concern is safety. That is such, Riverside Drive is so close in proximity to the edge of that green space. And I personally think that finishing out the promenade would give some measure of barrier between uh, children using that green space and Riverside Drive. Uh, even, the, even the curbs where you park, even if you open your door, you're in traffic. And I, I've heard at the Irish days that there were a lot of moms who were real nervous about their kids being along that edge. So I personally think if we can afford to do this, let's, let's get the promenade finished and try to get some sort of a protective barrier between that park and Riverside Drive. And hopefully we'll also be able to slow the speeds down a little bit there as we get more and more population. But um, yeah, I'd be for moving it up a year. Um, is, it's from a construction perspective, it's feasible to move it up by a year? Yes, I'm seeing head nods. Seeing head nods. Okay. I just want to make sure we weren't trying to ask you for something that wasn't even possible. Um, I, you know, I don't have a problem with moving it up. I think that park is something that people, I mean, I regularly receive comments and, oh, when's this going to be done? When's that, what's the next thing? Like, people are very excited about it. Um, and frankly, right now, it's nice to have something for people to be excited about, especially outdoors. Um, so uh, I would be fine in moving it up, especially if we have, um, as Matt's indicated, a couple of opportunities to try to cash finance rather than debt finance. Matt, the $975,000 in 24 is primarily what? Is that the kind of the infrastructure portion of it before the? My understanding is that's the design component. Getting a head nod. I would certainly be interested in it, pulling it at a minimum, the, desi the design numbers forward, and then you'd still have two years to decide if we could execute on the construction portion. <clears throat> Um, and as I read your numbers here, that doesn't, the design piece doesn't have as significant of an impact on our capacity to do other things as much as the construction does. And then we would be one year closer to understanding what our position was. Yeah, I think getting it designed, then you can answer the question a little bit more. I just, as when I looked at this plan, I thought that, and I know it hasn't changed, so that wasn't a change from what we had agreed last year. And I know the thinking was, let's see how she goes, but I... I think there's going to be quite an appetite. So we saw, and now we're changing our mind. <laughs> Any other comments relative to that? Okay. okay, I'll execute those policy changes for the amended document: uh, debt financing the design in 23 and debt financing the park in 24, and uh, we'll reevaluate those decisions at the next CIP next year. Okay. Uh, with that, then I'll make a motion that we postpone the second reading uh, and vote to September to the September 13th council meeting. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Uh, Jenny, would you please call the roll? Ms. Fox? Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Mayor Amrose Grooms? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Okay, I'll uh, make a motion to waive the council rules of order to consider ordinances 44-21 through 53-21 together. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Jenny, would you please call the roll? Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mayor Amrose Grooms? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Oh. Welcome, Matt. You, ha <clears throat> you have our staff presentation for these ordinances. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of council. There are no changes to these ordinances from the first reading. Uh, with that, staff is uh, recommending approval. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone present this evening in person or virtually that would like to comment? Hearing none. Council questions? Discussion? Hearing none. Um, Again, I think we would all like to thank the residents for um, participating with us in this really important project on a major thoroughfare through our community. Um, with that, Jenny, would you call the roll? 
Mr. Keeler? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Mayor Amrose Grooms? Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Ms. Aludo? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Thank you. Okay, bring us introdu introduction, first reading public hearing ordinances, ordinance 54-21. Adopting and enacting a supplement S-50 to the Code of Ordinances for the City of Dublin, Ohio. Laura Deeson. Thank you. And Jennifer Raindler has our staff report. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, members of council. The proposed supplement to the Dublin Code of Ordinances incorporates local legislation approved by council through June 30th of this year and state legislation that's approved through March 31st of this year. Now, typically there are no issues with the amendments that are pro uh, proposed for the state law revisions, but this time we had a concern that we wanted to raise to council. The initial proposed supplement from American Legal Publishing incorporated a change to state law that permitted low-speed micromobility devices, also known as scooters, to be on city streets, sidewalks, and shared use paths. Now, council studied the topic of scooters in the past and actually referred the topic to the Community Services Advisory Commission in 2018. CSAC reviewed that, came back to council, and recommended that no changes be made to the code, um, but that the city continue to monitor the situation. So consequently, we would recommend that the sections of the supplement dealing with the scooters be deleted. It's our opinion that any future potential regulation of scooters would go through a more thorough analysis and not just be made per a supplement from the codifier, um, but we wanted to get your direction prior to second reading on September 13th. Great, thank you. I uh, wanna take a moment to see uh, if there's any public comment either in person or virtually on this topic. Hearing none, council questions, discussion? Well, I have a question is probably directed to the police department <laughs> because we know that scooters are being used on our shared use path by all of our children, um, and we delete it from this. Um, so, how you know how are we are we even enforcing this? I guess that's the question because it, it everybody uses them. Yeah, thank you for the question, <laughs> Council Member Fox. Um, it is not some. It's not something we're actively enforcing. Certainly, when we get calls or complaints, our desire is to go out and, and start first and foremost with ed education to make sure that our pathways, our shared use paths are being used safely by anyone who is traveling on there. So it's not something we're writing citations for currently. Um, and certainly any change to the ordinance would still avail us the opportunity to have that similar conversation as it relates to safety from an educational perspective. Well, well I appreciate that. I, I agree. I think, I think that we're going to be getting these uh, new bikes. There's going to be all kinds of uh, elect electric vehicles that are going to battery operated vehicles. We, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to manage them all, but we certainly want our kids to know that as long as they're being safe and they're being careful that they can continue to use a shared use path. Um, so I, I, I went back through and took a look at the conversation that we had surrounding these and um, I, to Jennifer's point, I, I don't know that we want that necessarily, we want the codifier's language adopted um, at our next meeting. I would ask that we would strike them out. And if we want to have a, a deeper conversation about what to do about these micromobility devices, then we should definitely do that. And we, we should either lob it back over to CSAC, although I think at this point it probably needs to stay with us, and, and you know, put it on a workshop agenda or something. I don't know that we can solve that here tonight. Um, and since I don't think we can solve it here tonight, I think the language has to go. I would agree, and it's certainly nice to have the ability to regulate them should, um, should the need arise. Uh, so it, it gives us some flexibility. Um, I think that is, is important. Any other council comments, discussion? Okay, we will uh, have this second reading public hearing on September the 13th, but Jennifer, did you get the direction you were looking for? No, that direction was sufficient, and we'll delete that reference in the final version for the 13th. Thank you. Thank you. Ordinance 55-21. Amending the annual appropriations for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2021. I'll do so. Thank you. And Rosa has our staff report. Welcome. Hello. 
Good evening, council members. Ordinance 5521 amends the annual appropriation for fiscal year ending December 31st, 2021 to provide supplemental funding for Q3 2021. All pertinent information is included in your memo. Staff recommends city council approval of this ordinance at the second hearing scheduled for September 13, 2021, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. I want to take a moment to see if there is anyone present this evening in person or virtually that would like to make comment. Hearing none. Council questions, discussion? Thank you, good evening. Um, I had a question about section five um, on, so as I read this, this is actually an increase. This is revenue that was generated in excess of what we anticipated and that that, that funding would be then used to um, pay down the associated debt related to that. Do I understand that correctly? Because it didn't show up as a negative on the chart, so. That, that's correct. So we have revenue to offset the expense since the first year where we're um, paying this type of expense, so we under budgeted. So why the extra revenue? You help me out, Matt. <laughs> Which is all good, Matt. <laughs> Sure. This is uh, an NCA charge that's collected on the parcels. It's collected by the county auditor. There could be a number of reasons for delays, either delay in payment on the parcel owner or more likely just delays in setting up this NCA. For Block A, the NCA charges are still relatively new. If they received it late or had questions about how to handle it, it may have delayed the processing one year. Okay, so this is sort of a one-time thing. This is not an ongoing increase in the value of the properties or anything like that. I, I, I expect so, but I don't want to make promises for other government agencies. Um, we will continue to monitor it and, and dialogue if it is ongoing, but I expect it to be one time. Thank you. Other questions from council? I had just a couple. Uh, in section one, it talks about the um, disinfectant spraying, and there's two different contractual obligations, uh, but they're both for the recreation service fund. Um, can you can you tell me why there are two? That there's a sixty-two thousand, and then a forty thousand contractual obligation in section one. It's Brian. Um... Sorry. The contractual obligations out of the 101 fund are for all city facilities. The contractual obligations out of the 225 are specific to the recreation center. Okay, so, um, all right. And then uh, my question in section two, it talks of there's $65,000 in other professional services. Can you tell me what those might be? Sure, those are for locating services associated with the water and sewer lines. That contract has increased significantly recently, and we're in com conversations with that uh, provider um, about those services and that cost. Would that be the city of Columbus? Who does the locating on those water and sewer? USIC. USIC. Okay. Um, then my last question is in section four, it talks about um, appropriating the unappropriated balance, balances in the capital improvement construction fund and the sewer construction fund. There's like a 6,000 and a 3,300. Where, where did those come from? The investment fees. Mm -hmm. um, this is just an accounting entry. So previously okay. we were netting the uh, revenue and the expense and uh, per our chief accountant, we are now separating those, so we have the revenue to offset uh, the, the fees. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, we will look for second reading public hearing uh, September 13th on Ordinance 5521 as well. Okay, Ordinance 5621. Authorizing the city manager to execute an easement with American Electric Power for the installation of supplemental ele electric service from Riverside Drive to Riverside Crossing Park. Other do so. Thank you. And we go back to Mr. Ehrman. Matt, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this easement is actually to provide uh, electric service to the lower plaza on the northern end of Riverside Crossing Park. This was not necessarily an option prior to the July 26th council meeting at which the 2621 ordinance that was 
uh, approved, allowed AEP to um, loop its circuit um, near the park to provide that supplemental service availability. So um, just to give you an idea of where this uh, service will be located on the map there, it's just at the, the edge of the lower plaza. It will be very uh, inconspicuous in a landscape bed located at that, at that area. And just to give you a little bit of a more live rendering, you'll recall this, uh, this picture from our video that we had. The arrow is pointing to the general location of where that transformer will, will be located. That's looking northbound on the lower plaza. Looking from, there's our future promenade that we were talking about. Looking south uh, from the sidewalk of Riverside Drive, you'll notice that it's just to the south of the Boulder Play area um, along that, the plaza edge. Staff put together a series of renderings just to give you an idea of the types of vegetation and screening that will be available to keep this from being visible. Uh, for the most part, you'll notice that there is an edge wall behind where this will be located um, along Riverside Drive that, that sets this transformer down approximately two and a half feet from the edge of that wall. So it, it really brings it down off of Riverside Drive and, and then from the lower side, elevating some of that vegetation uh, with some evergreen materials and other types of, of plants to screen it as much as possible. This is a, a view from Riverview looking northwestward. Um, you can see that the screening there um, will pretty much hide that transformer for the most, for the most part. So this this easement gives us an opportunity that we haven't had before. Um, and now that we are near completion of the second phase of the plazas, we are at a, a cross point to be able to do this without interrupting anything that we would ultimately be constructing to put this in at a future date. This gives us an opportunity to run a variety of different vending options, vendor options, event types of things without having um, portable generators and things of the sort to bring the amount of voltage necessary to put on some larger things down there. So this is a great opportunity for us. Uh, staff will be bringing this forward to you at the September 13th meeting for the second reading and um, we'll be seeking approval at that point. I'd be happy to answer any questions or any comments. Great, thank you, Matt. I wanna take a moment to, uh, for public comment, either anyone in person or virtually that would like to comment relative to this legislation. Hearing none, council questions, discussion? You know, Matt, hey, thanks a lot for um, the screening details because that's gonna cut out that would cut out a lot of questions tonight. The other thing I, I think was really interesting and I hadn't thought about was you uh, setting this all up for uh, future electric um, sources for, um, and I don't, will this continue Will this allow the availability to go all the way down, the, or are we going to continue this down the greenway to, all the way to the uh, towards the bridge? Because you know, one one thing that's interesting about all of our uh, festivals is the constant electric lines running all over, with the uh, protective stuff over them to keep people from tripping. So this is really a nice thing to build into the project, and completely forgot about it. So it'll give us a lot of flexibility. If you look at the graphic here. That easement that was approved on the northern end of, of this graphic, um, we would be able to establish future easements for service anywhere along that line as needed in the future to accommodate whatever those needs are. Right now we feel as though the highest priority is where the construction is currently with concrete and brick laying and, and landscaping to get that accomplished now. Everything else would be in relation to lawn space and things that are easily repaired. Should be a huge uh, savings, really, when we do setups for festivals. Absolutely. It's going to be great. Thank you. Matt, would there be a master meter somewhere each time we tap? We won't need to do meter pit in the whole thing as well, or will this have a master meter on one end or the other? I believe each one will have its own um, because they have to be connected to the same source, as I recall. But um, I don't know if there's any knowledge to that. I'm, I'm imagining it would be a, a, a separate meter. It'd be nice if we could have a master meter on that line so that we didn't have to do multiple meter pits and future things to screen as well, but I'm sure that we'll, uh, that'll be left to you. I have one additional question because of the, the timing of the planting that will screen these um, units. I, it was my understanding that we pulled forward some of the planting along Riverside Drive, the, the hedgerow, um, 
forward when we pulled over some of the paths, walking paths on the west side of the river. So will, will this planting happen in conjunction or will these be screened and planted and then the future planting adjacent to Riverside Drive happen at a later date? These will be included in the existing or the current landscaping. Um, you, the promenade that we spoke of earlier will extend from the edge of where we're going to cut it off now up until up to John Shields Parkway. But there is probably, I'll say, a 50 foot section of that landscaping that is currently going in to finish off that area before the promenade goes in. So there is a fair amount of landscaping in that area already. Because I, I thought I recalled doing pulling some of those those hedge plantings forward to Jane's point before about you know security of children and so forth in the park. Um, so, okay, that's all I had. Anything? Any other questions, from Council? Oh. I just had a quick question, just for my own understanding. So. Um, I like the plant screening, et cetera. Was there consideration to give screening of a more permanent nature wall, decorative feature, what, it, anything other than plant, just from terms of how long it's going to take to become covered? Or yeah, I, given the time frame we had to work with here to get this in with the construction schedule, this was our preliminary attempt at screening. Once it's in, I think we can always take another look at it to see if there's something more appropriate. Okay, yeah, that might be interesting as we're landscaping it and doing that next phase. Thank you. Anything further? Thanks, Matt. Certainly do appreciate it. We'll look for a second reading public hearing on that on September the 13th. Thank you. Okay, introduction public hearing vote on resolution, resolution 50-21. Appointing a member to the City of Dublin Architectural Review Board. How to do so. Thank you. And we have our very own Vice Mayor DeRosa with the admin committee report. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, earlier this summer, the, as you recall, there was a uh, resignation from the Architectural Review Board, the ARB, resulting in a vacancy to an unfilled term. Council held interviews on August the 19th, and as chair of the admin committee, I am pleased to bring forth a resolution this evening for the appointment of Michael Jewell for a term on the ARB ending March 2023. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. I want to take a moment for public comment, either those present or virtually. Hearing none. Council questions, discussion? He's here tonight, so welcome. Jenny, would you please call the roll? Ms. Fox? Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Ms. Aludo? Yes. Mr. Peter, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Mayor Amrose Grooms? Yes. Putting it through it. Well, welcome, Mr. Jewell. We're looking for great things from you out of the ARB. <laughs> so the bar is set high. Okay, resolution 51-21. Authorizing the city manager to enter into a service agreement with Washington Township to provide flushing and pumping services for the public fire hydrants in the city of Dublin. I'll introduce. Thank you, and there's, there he is. Welcome, Aaron. Mr. Stanford, take it away. Good evening, Mayor and Member of uh, Council. Um, resolution 51-21, if approved, will authorize the city manager to enter into a service agreement with Washington Township to provide for flushing and pumping services of public fire hydrants. Washington Township has provided these services to the city of Dublin for many years, with the most recent agreement being approved in 2018, expiring at the beginning of August 2021. The cost per hydrant charge of $7 per hydrant remains unchanged from the 2018 contract. The projected annual cost for these services are $46,522 per year, and I will do my best to address any questions that Council may have about this resolution. Great, thank you. I want to take a moment for public comment, either anyone present in person or virtually. Hearing none, Council questions, discussion? It's always fun to watch them open up those hydrants and flood flood the water out on the street. So, thank you. Uh, Jenny, would you please call the roll? Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Ms. Aludo? Yes. Mayor Amrose Grooms? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Okay, resolution 52-21 declaring certain city-owned property as surplus and authorizing the city manager to dispose of said property in accordance with section 37.07 of the Dublin Codified Ordinances. I'll introduce it. Thank you. Mr. Ashford, welcome. 
we don't get to see you that often. <laughs> That's right. Um, good evening, members of council. Um, this resolution, 5221, authorizes the city manager to dispose of 12 vehicle assets and four non-vehicle assets that have out used, outlived their useful purpose. Uh, we normally dispose of these items via the GovDeals uh, internet site, which has been very successful to us. We are asking for a slight modification this time uh, because so many dealers now are offering great pricing on certain vehicles. We do want the option to, for our fleet manager to uh, horse trade and maybe get a, a great price on a trade-in, which we will then use to establish the minimum pricing for the gov deals. Uh, so we'll still take those items to gov deals, but uh, getting that written offer will help us to set that minimum pricing. So somebody out there in the world may offer a higher price. If not, we will use it as a trade-in. So that's just a slight difference that we're proposing moving forward. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Sorry, I'm getting kind of <laughs> cold here. Sorry. Great. Well, I will take just a moment for public comment. If anyone in, either present in person or virtually has interest in commenting on this legislation, hearing none. Uh, well, we're, we're used to hearing slight tweaks and those words, and I, I have to just take a moment to publicly thank you for all the work that you've done on this council chamber, because the, the numbers of slight changes and tweaks that you have handled in the past year, uh, that, that list on paper would fill this room. So thank you for all of your hard work on that. First and foremost, I want to make sure that we, we recognize you publicly for that. But um, any other questions? Council questions discussion relative to the presentation this evening. Only also to thank him for trying to save the taxpayer some money. So that's great that you came with that idea. And I also was on the steering committee and I know how hard you worked and I want to just second that. Thank you. You did. Oh, a thank lot. you. But there are a lot of people involved, as you know, including <laughs> members of council. So it turned out very nicely. So I was happy to be a part of it. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Um, Jenny, would you please call the roll? Ms. Aludo. Yes. Mr. Keeler. Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosa. Yes. Ms. Fox. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Reiner. Yes. Mayor Ambrose Grooms. Yes. Okay. Uh, this brings us to other business and the DORA update in our staff report will be from Allison. Lori, welcome. Thanks. I guess I'm a little shorter than Brian. <laughs> Let me pull up this. So I'm here tonight just to uh, recap some of the things that have been happening with our, our DORA district that's been in place since May. Um, as we promised back then, we were coming back at this meeting to discuss how the pilot went. I think one of the things we wanted to talk about is we talked about how we would know if we were winning with the uh, DORA. So we are going to go through some of those things tonight. Uh, we're going to just recap a little bit, talk about the police feedback, overall feedback both from our businesses and our patrons, and then kind of discuss maybe some things we might want to change. So I will bring uh, Lieutenant Latanzi up right now to s discuss the police part. Good evening, members of council. The police department had dedicated additional staffing with a focus on ensuring public safety through high visibility presence in an effort to monitor the door regulations and boundaries in addition to responding to calls for service in the area. This assisted in shorter response times and police intervention to traditional calls for service in order to provide safety measures to promote a sense of security for patrons of the historic Dublin and Bridge Park District. These officers were primarily utilized in an overtime capacity, which incurred approximately $9,200 in overtime costs. Officers responded to over 90 calls for service in Bridge Park and Historic Dublin during the door hours. When evaluating that data, only five of those calls may have been related to the DORA. And of those calls, none of those were significant or resulted in arrest or enforcement action taken by our officers. Lastly, the activity of the officers assigned to the DORA highlights the benefit of having dedicated police staff to provide safety and security measures in the DORA's unique environment. Furthermore, it ensured patrons of the city's vibrant downtown district recognize that the city of Dublin and the police department are responsive to their needs in ensuring their public safety. Thank you, Lieutenant. So we uh, have been 
having a survey up online since the beginning of the pilot, and uh, we promoted it multiple times on social media to get some feedback on that. Uh, most of our feedback did come from our city of Dublin residents, probably because that's really where we promoted it. Um, but one of the, oh, I think I went a little far. Oh, no, we're talking about the business feedback first. I have my pages out of order. <laughs> Um, but so we've talked to the business, same thing we've been talking to the businesses. Uh, some of these are retail, some of them are um, the Dora businesses themselves. So there's a little bit of difference in some of the feedback that we have seen from them. Um, but one of the things we noticed is that we really are seeing a sales impact. In fact, um, one of the Cameron Mitchell restaurants reported that they were 11% higher um, on Dora weekends since it started. So that was a, a real positive impact. We didn't get a lot of more details on some of those things from some of our businesses, but somebody like the, Doi, the Toy Emporium was really um, thanking council and the city for providing something that will help their businesses. So we've had a lot of positive feedback on that. And as you can see, the satisfaction level is really high from our businesses. From patrons, um, this has been pretty consistent since even before we started the Dora. Um, you can see overall 82% um, like the Dora, and we just have a few that have been not supporting the Dora, and they're probably some of the same people that have, um, we've seen coming along the whole time. But one of the things that came out of the survey that I thought was really important was how important it was for people to visit because of the Dora. So I think we had seen that competition from some of our neighboring communities. So one of the things in the survey really pointed out is that they really wanted to come here specifically for the Dora. You know, we are looking at 64% um, saying it was important or very important to why they chose to come to um, patronize some of those restaurants down there. So what we surveyed about the Dora days and um, also the times because I, we knew that that was something we wanted to discuss. And from the businesses, overwhelmingly, obviously, um, they wanted to increase the number of days and the number of hours. This was both from our um, retail businesses who wanted it to go a little earlier so they could capture some of that business because they don't always stay open as late. Um, but I also kept hearing often the um, ideas of happy hours uh, for opening a little earlier. And I think one of the big things um, after we had the Irish days and we had the Saturday and Sunday hours, there was so much public support for that and people just really enjoyed that. So I, that was what I think where we started hearing that feedback that they wanted those days to come out. It wasn't quite as overwhelming um, from our patrons, but again, that, that skewed a little before the Irish days. I think most people think um, either that they're too short or just right, but if you actually take out the people who say too long, which are the same people who don't support that we saw earlier in the week, they even out a little bit more, or in fact, the um, wanting more comes out slightly higher. Um, so we're looking at those kind of things as well. The sustainability in cups. Um, so one of the things we do have on order now, uh, if you see these, this is the um, trash cans that are down there now on the plazas. So we have ordered the composting bin that matches those and it's green, right, Sean? I almost forgot, we had a big discussion on what color these things are. So it'll have the signage on it saying that those are the compostable bins. Those won't just be for cups. If somebody has a leftover slice of pizza can go in there. Um, I know that Jenny's, all of their service materials are compostable and maybe we'll see some more of those things happening as we go along. Um, so we do expect those to arrive sometime this fall. Like many things, it's taking a little bit of time to get those in. We did have compostable cups for, um, in fact, if you go right now, you're most likely to get a compostable cup because we've had a mixture. One of the things we talked about is there are some storage issues that can't be stored in over 103 degrees, which is generally fine if you don't put it you know, right next to your oven or the back of your you know, refrigerator compressor or something. So it's just something our um, retailers needed to know, but we have yet to receive any reports of anybody having damaged product on those. What is kind of holding us up right now is there is a national cup shortage which there's a national all sorts of things shortage. <laughs> um, but for some reason, 16 ounce plastic and or compostable cups are nearly impossible to find right now. Um, we are hoping and praying that we get an order in this week. We have been promised an order that should ship actually tomorrow um, coming from Kentucky, so we should have them by Thursday. 
Um, but right now we are, we have 500 cups um, in our offices right now. Luckily, uh, a lot of our business is really ramped up for the Irish days and or ordered right after. So we aren't re receiving any reports from any retailers who don't have them. Um, they've also been really good with sharing with each other. You know, say North High has an extra box, they might, you know, take it over to the getaway or something like that. We know those things are going on right now. Um, we have 50,000 back order that have been ordered since June. Uh, the prices are getting ridiculous because this last order that we're getting this week, we had to pay 30 cents where those same cups when we ordered them in May were eight cents. So, um, and we did pay when we got the compostables, those were only 20 cents. So we're, right now you might even start seeing this in some retail establishments. I think someone told me Panera is not using the plastic cups. If you get a cold drink, you're actually gonna get the paper cup that you, that you would get for coffee instead. Um, so that's just a problem right now. Um, we are seeing online when we look for compostable cups, we're on about four or five different lists for them. The same website that I looked at three weeks ago said eight to 10 weeks. Last week it was 10 to 12 weeks. I looked again today, it's 12 to 14 weeks. Um, so we are committed to getting those compostable cups when they exist. And we will just keep doing our web searches to find cups, um, uh, any cups at all and we will just keep our fingers crossed that they come in soon, but just wanna make sure you guys are aware of what's going on. Another COVID issue that I don't understand. <laughs> so on the proposed changes tonight, uh, one of the things that council doesn't have to make an action for this, the, the DORA is in place. Um, so council just needs to make a decision if they wanna continue the DORA for the rest of the year. One of the things we talked about, and I, it's been some discussions, some of the communities only had it for summer or only had it at different times. We talked about, you know, we want to make sure that it's available when we have holiday activities, you know, in December. We know we'd want it to be active in March for St. Patrick's Day. So there really wasn't a lot of time in between there. And we also said we really want to take advantage of those 70 days in January, you know, when everybody just wants to go out. So we know that it is not gonna have the same number of people down at the door. We are probably not, and Lieutenant can answer this, but we probably aren't gonna staff it the same way with police. They'll be watching how the ebb and flow goes. Um, but that would be our first recommendation is just to extend it to a year round program instead of just ending um, sometime in the fall. Our other ch proposed changes, uh, if you look at it, you can see the hours that we have now, Thursday to Friday, five to 10, Saturday, five to 10, and Sunday, we don't have any hours at this point. We are recommending the four to 10. That comes from uh, the happy hour conversation that a lot of people are asking. Um, for example, like Boho also said that, that she closes at five. So if you know maybe the hours were a little earlier, she could kind of capitalize on some of that business as well. Um, so that's why we're proposing four o'clock on Thursday and Friday starting. And then on Saturday and Sunday, these hours um, mimic the hours we did for the Irish days. And I think that's one of the things we heard overwhelming feedback from the people that were there. Obviously there was things going on. We had, you know, entertainment and, and such. But I think Crawford Hoying is, for example, you know, they're planning on continuing, obviously, their farmer's market until I think the first week in October, they're gonna have a November market. Um, there's other events that wanna take place during those days, whether it's the um, strolls during the holiday shopping and those things. So it's, it's something that's gonna be ongoing that we're gonna see more activity down there during the weekends. Oh, and, um, I just wanted to bring up too, there was a letter in your packet that was from, uh, signed by Visit Dublin, HDBA, and Crawford Hoying on, on, for Bridge Park, asking for the Monday through Wednesday hours. Staff did not feel the recommendation right now just because that, that mix between the patrons was not a super strong feeling. But we also know, um, and also talking to police, there would be no real objection to that. We were just trying to weigh um, what, the, what our patrons were saying. Cost for cups, go back to my cup world. Um, I've talked more about cups in the last three weeks than I think I've ever talked about cups in my life. <laughs> um, but right now we know um, finance did a, um, they, they figured out the cost and right now it's costing us about 20 cents 
a cup, not including the price of the cup. That was based on the police. That was also based on some of our startup costs, like signage and such. Because we've only sold 77,000 cups, it's hard to really spread that cost out. We know that cost could fluctuate over the next couple of months. We also know 100% that the cost of the actual cups are going to fluctuate. So we didn't want to right now say, oh, we're paying 30 cents a cup because we know that's not going to be consistent throughout the year. Uh, so what we're proposing is changing that price right now. We're charging them 10 cents to make that 25 cents to re recoup some of those costs. And we want to look at that again in a few months when things kind of even out so we know what we're doing so that we're not losing money on these, um, but that we're not going to be making money at this point on those cubs. So also the extension. I think um, if you had read any of the survey comments, um, the number one other than asking for the Saturday was the bridge. It came up, I think, in 20 some percent of the open-ended questions. Um, specifically the bridge, but we know that the park will be opening this fall as well. So one of the things we talked about is staff. I think it makes sense for us, maybe at this point isn't the right time to have that discussion. Maybe once we get um, you know, the, the East Plaza fully open in the park, I think it might make sense for us to look at that again. So I did suggest in here that we would come back um, you know, in January or February or March to talk about um, both that possible extension and the cup price and anything else we might want to change at that point. So we thought that was a good time to kind of regroup on that. And that's everything I have right now and I can answer any questions or anything you have. Okay, I want to take a moment uh, for public comment either in person or virtually if there's any comments. Okay, hearing none, council questions, discussion? I just think it's uh, interesting that uh, our reports from the lieutenant are about the same as every other city that's done this. I mean, there was some fear that, you know, there's going to be some kind of problems with this. But you look at Marysville and Hilliard and, you know, all the police departments reported back that, hey, this is not really a big problem. But there was a lot of people that did have worries about it. So thanks, lieutenant. Thanks for your report. Other comments? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, Allison, um, do we pay for the cup or does the restaurant pay for the cup? So we had tried to figure out the best way to do this. Right now we're doing it where we are buying the cups ourselves and we're taking orders. We want to get away from that. We want to find a consistent supplier who will ship directly to the restaurants. We have some that are interested in that, but again, because of the inability to get the cups, we don't have that set up right now. So we are hoping once things get normal that we won't have to touch it, because right now we're in the cup ordering business. Well, we could be in the cup ordering business, but do, then we do sell them to the restaurant? Yes, yeah, so, so they basically they go online and tell us, they put an order in, and then they have to come right. pick them up at, our, at the so, service center. Okay, so we're, we get reimbursed for our cups. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, we're not covering cost. the cost of the cups. Not right now because, again, we didn't know that the costs were going to go crazy. But we were when our, with our first order when we were first doing the uh, price analysis. Okay. And then on the, the survey that you did on the satisfaction, I'm assuming that you hit mo not every business, but probably most of the businesses on both sides. We had about 24 responses, and there, there did seem to be a nice mix on both sides. Um, but, and again, we had restaurants, but we also had like Boho and Dublin Toy Emporium. So we had sort of a mixture of, of some different people at Modern Mail. So we had kind of a variety of business owners that were part of the door and those that weren't. But everybody got a, an opportunity. Oh, and absolutely. Sent we sent it out to... Okay. Everybody, I think they get hit 14 times to do the survey. <laughs> I know, it's hard to get responses back from surveys. Yes. And my other question is um, that there were 90 calls you said that were from um, during that period of time. Is that pretty much what you would consider average DORA, no DORA? Yeah, I couldn't speak directly to the averages without talking to the analyst. However, we do see... Uh, quite a bit of calls in the Bridge Park and Historic District area. The benefit was is because we had additional staffing down there, they were able to respond to those calls uh, quite possibly quicker than what we would normally do because they were on foot and on bicycles down in that area. So we were able to resolve those um, to the satisfaction of, of our customers um, down in that area. So uh, we did not see a tremendous increase in calls. 
uh, during the door hour specifically, and it gave us an opportunity to evaluate um, the patron activity down there as well to ensure that we were responding to the needs of the area during the door time frame. With all of the um, new energy that's happening down in the district, is there any particular complaint call that you're getting that is different than before we became, you know, quite so entertainment oriented? I mean, are you getting noise ordinance problems? Is there anything that we should know about that's happening down town because of the changes that over the last few years that maybe we should be aware of? Sure, I think with the increase in patrons down in that area, it does highlight an opportunity for um, citizens to provide us uh, feedback on what issues they are seeing in that area. So we have focused additional attention both on um, traffic uh, issues along Riverside Drive as well as some concerns that have been brought to our attention in the parking garages. Uh, so we're continuing to research, evaluate, partner with Bridge Park, and provide additional staffing to address the needs of those individuals who've raised those concerns. That's great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Something that's come up, Lieutenant, that's interesting is the noise of certain yes, cars yeah. just roaring up and down. I, I'm sure. Have you heard this complaint? I have, Council Member. You have? Yes. Yeah. I don't, is there anything we can do about that? People ask me that all the time, and I'm sure it's disruptive for the people up in the uh, living above there, and you know, but seems that I don't know what it is, but seem, people seem to express their ego in a very loud, noisy car racing it back and forth up and down the street there. And it's very uh, disruptive. So thank you for that, uh, Council Member Reiner. One of the things that we're currently doing is we have heard um, some of those complaints come from uh, community members that reside in Bridge Park. So we're currently doing some research on different avenues of educational efforts. Um, potentially a sound study uh, that we discussed with the engineering department and researching some technology out there that would give us a better understanding of the uh, problem uh, potentially that uh, is existent down there in regards to the noise. However, some of that technology only exists outside of the country right now. So we found some, some unique pieces of technology that exist in Europe, but nobody in this country right now are using those. So we're trying to find some other creative solutions to evaluating that problem and dedicating the right resources and education to community members because the environment down there, I think, also plays a part um, in amplifying potential noise that would not seem so loud in other areas of the city, but because they get in between those buildings and in those parking garages and with a river and how sound amplifies off of water, it does sometimes seem very loud. So we want to do our due diligence in researching um, that problem and providing the right solution to address those concerns. Well. Other comments? Yeah, Andy? I want to talk more about the cups or ask some questions about the cups. So there's two different kinds of cups. Um, does a patron, how does the patron know whether their cup is compostable or not? Right now they don't unless they look at the cup. You can read it and it'll, it'll, the recycling one has a recycled bottom and the compostable one just says it's compostable because we weren't consistent. We knew we couldn't get a consistent quality of those. We didn't want to promote that some you could and some you couldn't. Um, because right now we also don't have the cans to compost. The goal would be is to have them all compostable and have the cans down there and then do the education based on that. But we don't want to do that until we make sure that we have them. OK. Um, the next question is maybe better suited to Rumpke, who was here a couple weeks ago. But in practice, you have two receptacles, the, the blue one, which is for recycling, and, and the traditional one. How much regular trash ends up in the recycling bin, and how feasible is it really to sort that? I'm all for zero waste. I go to Ohio State games like Chris does, and I see this zero waste concept, but I just wonder in practice how feasible it really is right now, today. 
Yeah, and I, I do think Rumke could probably answer that a little better than I could, but I do know um, we've been talking to uh, Hilliard as well as Bexley and, and uh, Nick Puck actually talked to him, but one of the things Hilliard is doing, they are only doing it right now during their Thursday concert series, and they're having volunteers uh, monitor those um, receptacles. So we do know that's going to be a bit of a challenge. One of the things we talked about is if we could get volunteers down there those first weeks that we introduce it and say, here they are, and this is how we're doing it. It's gonna be a lot of ed education that we think that we're gonna to have to get our patrons to understand how to use that. Yeah, and con contamination of recycling is definitely a challenge, and that's what Rumpke would share, and that's also what's contributed to the um, fluctuation in pricing associated with the recycling services. So it used to be that that was free, and they make a bar make some money off of it. Now, you know, we have to pay. More communities have to pay for that, and largely that's due to contaminated recycling. Uh, Allison, thank you for your work on this. I had a couple of questions. So is this is our midpoint check-in, is that right? Because this will run through October, is that correct? No, actually, um, it runs indefinitely at this the point. Pilot. The pilot, um, we had said today was uh, or August 30th was our date for the check-in. So we didn't have an October date. It was just August 30th. We had said that we would um, decide whether we were going to continue or not. But next, okay, I was just confused. I thought this was sort of our midpoint check-in and then October we were, gonna, we were gonna evaluate that again. So I was a little confused about that. Am I the only one that was confused about that? You were confused about that, okay. Um, so I, I had a, a question just about the overall cost of this. I know that was one of the questions mm -hmm. that we had and I didn't necessarily see that as a summary chart. I see pieces and parts, but sort of, what is it costing the city? What is it costing the you know taxpayers at today? And what do we think that might look like when we're through crazy cut pricing time and moving forward? Um, and then you know, with the extension of hours that are proposed in days, what is that additional cost to the city? And I, I didn't see that analysis. And we can provide that. It's actually most of it is the police cost right now. Um, and that changed midway through the period. Um, some of the startup costs were doing the signage and stuff that was minimal, that was maybe $1,000. Um, and that's really been the majority of the cost right now is the police. Um, so that's something that will, they're still kind of monitoring and changing that a bit, but we can get you the final cost. It was, um, I, can, I can't do the math in my head. I used to be able to do math in my head. 77,000 times 20 cents. No, no, I, that's fine. In, in I, I just think that's the total, whatever that is. I think it's important for us to yes, see what I, that looks like. That was one of the things we said mm -hmm. we had agreed as a group where we were going to look at. Yeah. And so if we're going to add Sunday now, that's another nine hours of police um, law enforcement coverage costs there. I'm getting a head nod. So I, I just think it's important for us as we extend some of the hours that we understand this, there's education costs. Again, don't, I, I'm, I think this is a good program, I'm for it, but I, I, that was one of the things we said at the mid-year check-in or whatever this is, that we were just gonna understand what this was costing us. And I, I think it's important that we see that so that we understand that and that we can communicate that to the residents as well as we move forward. Um, and, and I then, did the quick math, and I don't know if it's right, um, but from May till now, it's been about 15500 the majority of that in policing. And so um, one of the things we talked about earlier is who's paying for the cups. So the cups will be paid, the city's paying for the rest. Again, I, I, I would like to see that in some sort of a write-up as to what the, what the impact of this is and what we anticipate going forward. Again, not to be negative, but I, I think we, we owe that to, to ourselves and to the community 
as to what this program was costing us. So I'd appreciate that, thank you. Um, and then the second sort of question is I was reading in the mem memo that there isn't recycling in Bridge Park at all, so we would have a combustible, but we wouldn't have a recycling, or we do? I, I probably just misunderstood that. Could you explain that? Yeah, the only place that there are recycling cans right now are um, these locations here that have these. And right now those are on the east and the west plaza. And Sean, was there anywhere else? I think those were, I believe, only on the east and west plazas. I think yeah, that's, is that correct? Once. once the park opens, yeah. But in, in Bridge Park itself, I mean, in the development itself, there are no recycling bins? No, and we are not, we, um, Crawford Hoying does handle all the trash on their side. Um, so right now they do not have um, recycle bins, they only have trash bins. Wouldn't it kind of make sense that we would require that if we're trying to get to zero sustainability for this type of a program? Wouldn't that seem like a logical request or ask? Yeah, we can certainly talk to them about that very topic, um, considering that the park isn't part of the DORA boundaries. Um, we can have that conversation with them about, you know, as we move forward with the DORA. I'm done. Are there uh, waste receptacles? Do they match the re waste receptacles that we have put in the park area? No. I believe their no. receptacles are different. Those were um, determined as part of the streetscape planning program, I believe. I would think that would be an additional hurdle to educating the public about contamination and what goes where. But yeah. And that, that's part of the rationale behind blue, you know, one of the, you know, recognizable features of recycling is blue. So that's always a best practice that's discussed for recycling so that people see blue and they know that they can recycle there. The green will probably be a higher hurdle to get over because some might think that they're green just because they're in Dublin and mm -hmm. not understand that that's the universal composting color. So probably have some education to do on that. I had a, a number of questions. So I read through all the comments and it seemed like a disproportionate amount of comments that were negative towards the DORA were from Bridge Park residents. Um, did we divide it up at all by where, where it is that you live? We didn't do it with this one, but we could go back and do that analysis. They didn't have to give their address, um, but it is something that we could go back and try to match up. So the majority of the ones that I read that were negative on it were, happened to be residents in, in Bridge Park, and I think that would be interesting to understand why. Um, you know, I, I, as I said earlier, I am very much in favor of compostable materials in here, and I'm wondering if, you know, if we're going to be um, really aiding this area by these efforts, if we couldn't try to encourage everyone that has um, takeables to use compostable materials, be it in an ice cream shop or a coffee shop or not just, not just alcohol that people carry with them, but to try and encourage compostable materials in anyone that would walk out the door with something. I, I think that that's important for us in terms of sustainability. Um, the Sunday night till 10 p.m., I think if you lived in that district that that is a, a difficult time. I don't know that we need to go till 10 o'clock. I'm not opposed to necessarily having Dora on Sunday. I don't know, nor am I opposed to having it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but maybe those times end earlier, say 8 or 6, um, maybe something that would provide more quiet to the evening, it being a work night and things like that. I. Um, I, I don't know that I would be in favor of Sunday night till 10 o'clock. That, that seems um, a little late to me. And, and actually, that, that was one debate we had because for Irish days, we did go till 8. I think there was some thought of the consistency. Is it going to get confusing if every other night is 10 and then Sunday went to 8? It's something we could do education for. And again, if Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday were in and they were 8, that might be easier to sort of explain it to. I think a lot of this comes to consistency sometimes. You know, if you switch every day, they go, wait, is it 
this day, time, this, you know, it's hard for the retailers and the patrons, but I think it would make more sense if it matched up some of the other days as well. I would think it would be even consistent with the restaurant hours, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday is a, is a later night than Sunday through Wednesday. So I, I think that that would be consistent. Um, you know, I, several of the comments, I probably think at least five of them were folks that were living in Bridge Park that said that they had children. Um, and certainly that, I think that would be helpful. Uh, and I too would be really interested in a, a comprehensive look at what this is costing us. I, I know that it's more than our police overtime and, and you know, the added police, you know, perhaps it might, might rise to the level of an additional officer that would be in charge of patrolling there. But we have a lot of marketing expense. We have a lot, uh, you know, certainly your time with dealing with, you said you've talked more about cups in the last weeks than, than you ever have before. And, um, I'm assuming that that's part of your time here with the city. So all of those have expenses. And um, I, I really, I, I want this to be successful and I think that it is wonderful for our community. But if I'm a business outside of Bridge Park, I don't want this additional subsidy happening for the company, you know, the institutions that are part of Bridge Park. And so I just wanna make sure that the playing field is very level and that we've taken a really holistic look at what are all of our expenses? What, you know, let's, Let's count everything up and leave leave nothing unaccounted for that um, that are resources required to make this happen. Because I think that is important for our integrity, so that we we didn't say, oh well, you left out, you know, X and Y and Z. Um, and I think that was all that I had. So, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. All good. Um, I, I agree that having um, a little bit of a perform on the financials would be really helpful. Also, sort of footnoting which items are the items that you expect pricing to change as you put that together, because that would be really helpful as we think about the total cost. Um, and then uh, sort of a breakdown of how you came up with the 25 cents per cup would be great. Um, I am also not opposed to doing a Sunday through Wednesday till, I don't know, 7 or 8 o'clock or whatever. Then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, um, I, I think that, you know, till 10. I think those hours are very fair. And that's something I'd like to talk about when we, when you bring the rest of this stuff back. Um, that's it. Chris? Yeah. Uh, you know, I just want to uh, talk a minute about the hours because um, 9 a.m. on Saturday, you know, we have, we're a little different than some of the others. We have the library, um, you know, Hilliard is noon to nine Monday through Monday through Sunday. Um, I don't know other than the farmers market on at Bridge Park why we would need nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. There's a lot of kids that walk the historic district, go down and get coffee, ice cream. I mean, I I want the door to succeed. I want to see the restaurant succeed, but but I do wonder whether or not we're pushing the envelope when it comes to the family atmosphere that we have, especially on the west side. And um, I, I don't know that people in Bridge Park bought into Adora, you know, like from the time they get up in the morning till the time they go to bed at night on a Saturday. So I would not be for nine o'clock. I think noon is much more reasonable. And I think it gives people family time in the morning and you don't have to worry about, you know, it's just the, um, it's just the atmosphere that it creates. So that would be my, my thought. Yeah, I think we should talk about the hours. I, I, I'd like to see some of the costing stuff, but I do actually think we should have a little bit of, of a discussion about the hours. Um, you're right, I think it's at maybe 9 a.m. is a little early, but so, I, you know, we don't have to do anything, I don't think, tonight, right? So we can totally have, I think we should have that discussion about the hours. Well, I, I think I'd like to make a motion that we... Um, I don't, I don't know if we need to vote on this. Is it, it asks that we um, approve the year round and perhaps should we table it? Should we delay a vote? What is the most accurate procedural way to get to where we were trying to get to? 
Right, so there's no action required to continue the DORA as is. So you don't need to, con to make a motion to that effect. Um, I don't know if staff knows how long it will take to get that additional information together, if we could postpone to a date certain, or if we can just, you've given direction and they can come back under other, right. either next meeting or the meeting after that. Right, being on other business, I don't, didn't know if, it, if we had to require to actually take any action or if we could just say, we've, we've heard a lot of really good information tonight there are a few outstanding questions that we would like staff to come back with some answers to and possibly a little bit of discussion that we might like to have um, whenever you're ready for that and we will put it back on the um, other business and a future agenda. And, and one question I have on the cost, would you wanna see it, um, I'm trying because we did it by, by the cup because we were trying to figure out how to break it down. Would it make more sense, you'll wanna see the overall cost but then maybe break it down by day or just maybe just the overall cost? I think we just want to see the overall cost okay. and maybe, you know, the, the average number of cups we've gone through this year. Mm -hmm. I think that probably is a good indicator of how many cups we would see in, in future years. Mm -hmm. um, so if we could get those two pieces of item, a really holistic look at costs and then the number of cups that we've used this year, be a time, you know, so average per week you know, 1100 a week or whatever that number is so that we can start thinking about what we would want to charge for these cups or have be charged for these cups. Okay. Yeah, and if, if I may, some of these costs will be estimates because, you know, for example, emptying the trash receptacles and recycling receptacles, it's difficult to know whether the material in there is from the DORA versus, you know, park patrons or historic Dublin or Bridge Park patrons. And then one reason we were proposing the check-in early next year was to see the cost kind of stabilize because I know police was working through their staffing and then we were waiting on the cups and then we were waiting to see, you know, about the trash receptacles and the composting that will be coming online so just yep I think all awareness. anyone's asking for up here is the best estimate you know okay. we can only you know in good faith do do as well as we can do and yeah. that's all. and then yeah I, I think the model itself is maybe even more interesting than this precise numbers right so th these are the things that are costing us money the ingredients yeah. in the ingredients and these are the things that are variable and then at least we know the model right and some of them are, are more fixed and some of them aren't but if we understand the model then the estimates are what they are but I think that will help us and then as we go through time we can begin to see the other thing is you know I think it's important just to say clear that the business's contribution in there right so what are they paying for like in the cups are they paying the full price of the cups or what is that plan over time a recovery if you will if you want to use that because I know that's not fully but I I think the recipe and the recovery would be what I would be looking for Allison I would assume your intention is to get out of the being the intermediary on the cups so if you can do that then we're no longer subsidizing it because they're ordering it directly from the supplier one of the things we talked about, and again, we were in some conversations and then they all broke down, um, but the idea we were talking to some people about maybe they would, say we knew the actual cup cost was 10 cents, um, but then our costs were 20 cents on top of that, that the um, person selling to the businesses would sell it to them for 30 cents and then write us a check for that extra 20 cents for that recovery. Does that make sense? so that we would be getting a check from whoever the cup supplier was every month that was the overage to pay for that difference. We haven't found anybody for sure that was willing to do that because we were talking to a few people and then everything broke down because nobody could get the cups. Um, but that would be a goal for ours in the long run. If we can't make that happen, then we may have to stay in the cup business, which would not be ideal, but we could then just add that on to the cost. It's not that hard if we had a consistent supply. And then for what, for what it's worth with regard to the days of the week and the hours from staff's perspective, the more predictable, the better, because um, that really helps our staffing and it also helps with our communications efforts. You know, it's a challenge in itself to communicate with all of our residents and every time we change it up with regard to DORA, we'll have to go through a separate communication, but then DORA brings in visitors from the outside and it's even more challenging to you know commute any changes to visitors i would think we would have a starting time certain monday through friday and a starting time certain saturday sunday 
and then an ending time certain Sunday to Wednesday, and then an ending time certain Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So it would be as predictable as we can be without inhibiting Thursday night and Friday night activity. Yeah, I think staff would be very supportive of that. I, I think that would and be And I, okay. I believe that's what's behind Hilliards, because I know they started out with more minimal hours, and then they expanded, and I believe it was primarily due to the desire to be more predictable so people don't show up thinking that there's a door and there's not and getting into that situation. Craig, did you have comment? None. It just seems to me that you know, coming up with what you just said, Mayor, is an hour for the first part of the week, hour for the weekends make it simple okay well uh, when you uh, are able to assemble all of that information we will coordinate spot on the agenda to, to finish that conversation and, and have the votes that everyone's looking for so that we can continue with the project all right thank you very much thank you so much okay it brings us to staff comments and uh, the general is on vacation so there's a new sheriff in town and I just have one quick, up, quick update, and that's a reminder that the rec center was closed as of last Saturday through the 6th for the annual deep cleaning and other work that cannot be done when it's open. So our communication staff has been doing a great job um, communicating alternatives that will help mitigate that closure for our residents. That includes we're offering free outdoor fitness classes. The North Pool is open during school or um, for the back to school hours, we have the outdoor exercise equipment, and then we, of course, we have the paths and the parks that residents are able to utilize. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council reports, committee reports. We'll start with the admin committee. Kathy? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the admin committee met on Tuesday, August the 24th. We had a great update from staff on information technology. Um, we extended our Thanks and appreciation for all of the work that uh, they did to help us through navigating all the technology that we had to navigate through, through, through COVID and building this chamber and a variety of other things. And we got an update on some of the innovation projects going there. Um, we also had a discussion of council rules of order and we had some suggested updates largely to, to, to bring those rules up to sort of current day. Um, an update's gonna be provided to council here um, shortly for your consideration sometime next month and that'll be back before you. Um, and then our last topic, um, we had an opportunity for our continued discussion that we've had about public engagement and boards and commissions. And so we've made some good advances, staff has done some great work there. Um, so you will see an update on that. Our takeaway is we ask staff to please prepare for sort of a work plan for what this looks like, the set of activities over this next year. And they will also, will bring that back to council for consideration. So that's what we covered at the meeting. Um, and then uh, my only other comment is we look forward to our council retreat on September 9th and 10th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Community Development Committee, Mr. Reiner. Uh, community Development uh, met in an informative session uh, to discuss the Metro Center, and a very robust, robust discussion ensued on what it might be. Included were a number of developers and stakeholders who made the uh, interesting, much more interesting and uh, far-reaching. Um, the uh, discussion even included possibly rebranding the name of that particular development. Um, and so there's very, very many important uh, questions and comments. So this will go on into the future. Again, the meeting was basically informative to bring forth new ideas. There'll be a number of follow-up meetings as the ideas are refined. So please read the minutes for, the, uh, for this very important meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Finance Committee, Ms. Ludo? Nothing this time. Thank you, and Public Services Committee, Ms. Fox? Yes, um, Public Services met um, on August 23rd and we discussed the water and sanitary sewer extension policy, which is lengthy. <laughs> um, there, we did have an overview and a background. Um, the uh, committee members requested some updated numbers to reflect the number of homes that were um, going to be serviced with an extension um, financing options, because we found that it's quite expensive to tap in or to move these extensions around the city. Um, the cost of construction is high. 
and a reassessment of the health and safety risks because there are priorities about which part of the city is going to get the extensions. Uh, the city um, evaluates which ones are more of a health and safety concern and if there are options to try to, um, to reach those in any other way. And then the second um, subject was waterway maintenance. Um, our waterways are being evaluated um, with, and there were recommendations and we'll come forward with some um, more information uh, at, at future meetings on um, evaluation and um, maintenance of our waterways. And the committee did express an interest in discussing uh, waterway amenity enhancement as part of the, ne of the next discussion. Great, thank you. Okay, we'll go to liaison reports and we'll stay with you for the Planning and Zoning Commission. Jane? I don't have anything to report on that. Bridges? Uh, yes. Um, let me get to this one. Uh, Dublin Bridges is um, asking the community to um, consider uh, logging onto their website. And they provide personal care pantries for all of the schools here in, uh, in Dublin. And those personal care pantries include toothpaste, toothbrushes, all sorts of things that many of the, uh, the nurses and the counselors find that some children need. Um, and uh, a $10 donation, maybe given on a monthly basis by uh, members of the community would go a long way in keeping those pantries stocked. Every school has them and they are usually um, well used. So I encourage you to go to DublinBridges.org and uh, sign up for an ongoing $10 a month donation. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Washington Township? Um, Washington Township um, just has a couple of upcoming um, uh, very important classes they're offering on September 20th. They're offering their CPR and their um, AED certification. That would include adult and pediatric CPR and how to use the um, automatic external defibrillators. That's available for children 12, 12 and up, so you can go with your child and learn that. And then on September 21st, uh, a class called Until Help Arrives, which is the opportunity to help learn what to do before first responders arrive at a scene. And that is um, on September 21st from six to nine, 13 years and up. Great, thanks. Also a reminder at 9.59 on September 11th, uh, at, at uh, Station 93 on Brand Road, they'll have a ceremony there for the September 11th events. Okay, um, Kathy, US 33 quarter? Uh, nothing tonight. Thank you. Mr. Keeler, Logan, Logan Union, Champaign County Regional Planning Commission. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm always astounded by the amount of development that's occurring in Union County. I've said, that, said this before. So you have three counties in this group. 80% of the agenda is Union County development. And probably of that, 80% is right on our border. Um, Glacier Point on Mitchell DeWitt is an example of that. Dublin City Schools um, to the other side of uh, Industrial Parkway, same thing. So it's definitely something to pay attention to. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Reiner, Arts Council. Let's see, we're going to continue the um, Sundays at the Scioto. The concerts start from 5 and go to 6.30. Uh, we're getting down to the last three, and uh, one of them is called B-Twins, which is a group from the slums of Rio de Janeiro. Um, they uh, will be playing classical music on uh, violins that their father had made. It's very interesting. And then there'll be the Wildflowers on October the 3rd, tribute to uh, Don Petty and the Heartbreaks, and Doolin for some Celtic music. Uh, launching a new exhibit, um, Language of Creativity, October 29th, um, or September 21st to the 29th. So please um, read the information on the internet and catch up with all these exciting activities in our city. Great, thank you. And the Veterans Committee? Uh, nothing, Mayor, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Peterson, Board of Education? Nothing to report, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, for the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, uh, we have an executive meeting uh, this week, so we'll, I'll have a report next time. Uh, brings us to council roundtable. So I'll start down there, Mr. Peterson. Ms. Aluto, Mr. Reiner, Mr. Keeler, Ms. Fox, 
Mr. Rosa? Uh-oh, no. The only thing that I wanted to say is that the mayor and I had the opportunity to attend the uh, joint Dublin Chamber, Union County, Logan County Business Impact Breakfast last week, and the focus was really on the US 33 Smart Corridor and the launch of the Beta District. Um, our own Megan Callahan did a great job of updating with the COG and the work that has been done there. It is amazing to see what has happened um, over the last, what, three to four years there. Um, and the momentum will only continue on Wednesday, September 15th. There will be a ribbon cutting and continued conversation at the Transportation Research Center in East Liberty. So we're very proud of the work. We're very proud to be a partner on this work and the impact is, is, is amazing and stay tuned. Great, thank you. Uh, and I would like to add, um, last, last week I had the opportunity, last Wednesday the 25th, uh, Welcome Warehouse held an event. Um, they called it Cocktails and Conversation and they, uh, they revealed a new branding for themselves and they have rebranded themselves as One Dublin. So if you hear of an organization, One Dublin, it is the uh, relaunch brand refresh for Welcome Warehouse. So uh, certainly want to congratulate them. They, they did have um, an extensive fundraising evening and uh, certainly look forward to some good things that could happen in the community as a result of that. Um, and with that, if there is nothing further, we will stand adjourned. Another great meeting. Oh, how's the kids doing? Everything okay? Yeah, everything's fine. Are you guys running ragged? Yeah, it's football season. Oh, I know. That's what I mean. Yes. It's game, 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 game. We're practice, nuts. practice, practice. I mean. We are absolutely. Yeah, because I haven't nuts. seen you. The Johnson.